Uh, I'd like to call to session. It's uh, Wednesday, April 20th, 2022. I'd like to call uh, session the Wyoming Game and Fish Commissioner meeting. If you wouldn't mind, if we could stand up and pledge allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Thank you. Um, I'll take a roll call now. Uh, Commissioner Doobie? Here. Commissioner Bird? Here. Commissioner Brokaw? Here. Commissioner Ladwig? Here. Commissioner Jolovich? Here. Mr. Commissioner Ludvell? Here. And myself as Commissioner Roberts. Um, I guess we can go ahead and go into our first item. This will be item number six, and it'll be appeal 22125 on uh, Josh Longwell. Morning. Morning. Uh, President Roberts, Director Nesvik, members of the commission, good morning. We're going to start the day off with a damage, appeal, a damage claim appeal, claim number 22125. Um, in this claim, uh, the claimant, Josh Longwell, the HD Ranch, he filed a claim February 1st uh, for grizzly bears and mountain lion damage to cattle and sheep in the amount of $236,554.10. Uh, in his request, it was specified 188,000 just over for grizzly bear damage to 76 missing steers, calves, 50 missing heifer calves, and 117 missing ewes, and about 48,000 and a half for mountain lion damage to 178 missing lambs. Um, I know you have this all in the uh, in the packet, but I did print you a copy of the entire claim. Uh, I know it's easier to move around on paper than through the computer. I also provided that same copy to Mr. Longwell. Um, so the department verified 10 calves, 18 ewes, and 13 lambs as killed by grizzly bears. Also verified 11 lambs and seven ewes as killed by mountain lions, both in the open range setting. We also verified one ewe as killed by mountain lions in a pasture setting. Uh, the claimant reported missing 126 calves, 178 lambs, and 117 ewes at the end of the grazing season. And per regulation and statute, uh, we can play a multiplier on those open range settings of three and a half for grizzly bears and mountain lions. Therefore, we can, the department can offer payment for 35 calves, 88 and a half ewes, and 84 lambs. So the department's total recommended payment is $100,288.89. Um, Mr. Longwell is here today to present his side of the appeal and then Lou Gelsbury will present the department's investigation. So, uh, Josh? Good morning. Good morning. I'm not sure who does your scheduling, but to start your day with me is going to be a little rough. Uh, I guess it'll get better when I get done. Um, I'm going to hand out a few maps just so we get that over with. I'll, we'll get to these here in a little bit. So I'll give everyone a map just for, oh, you can look at them, some representation. Yeah, I think there's a map for them too, I believe. Um, I appreciate your time. Um, we're back again. I don't, I don't think this is gonna go away and I know you guys don't think it will either. Um, once again, guys, here's all my affidavits. All these, that's, that's one year right there. This is last summer. So then we take these guys, let's add them to them. This is what we've been dealing with. This is 10 years of damage, folks, 10 years. Like this is a problem. It's not about missing livestock. It's not about multiplier. It's the economics of trying to do business with grizzly bears on your ranch. And there is a bunch of lion damage in here too. I understand that. There's enough affidavits in here. If you just take the females to stock most ranches in Wyoming, just the females alone, the reproduction cycle of what's missing and gone right here would take care of a lot of ranches in Wyoming. We cannot sustain this. I've been here 10 years. Most of you guys, I don't even have been here that long. We started down this road in 2012, guys. My kids were here and they were little bitty. I got a boy that's graduating high school this year and we still have not solved this problem. So I come to you, the state of Wyoming manages and the Wyoming Game and Fish, they're stewards of the wildlife. Your job as a commission, you're policymaking, you're responsible for the 
direction and the supervision and of the director. And it also says in here, your adequate and flexible system of control. So we have some flexibility. You guys have the flexibility to solve this problem. The Game and Fish Commission. I've been all the way to the Supreme Court. We get to the Supreme Court and the Wyoming Game and Fish says, well, they got to go to the commission or they got to go to the legislation. I sent a letter to every state legislator, every entity in Wyoming about what's going on. We're a small county in this state. There's only two or three counties dealing with it. And I differ to say that we're the only one dealing with this, this volume of damage right now. I don't know why they like the Alcricks. You tell me. It's the abundance of wildlife. If it's, they get left alone, I have no idea, but we are inundated with grizzly bears. So you guys have the flexibility to fix this. I mean, the legislators, we, they're not gonna do anything. It doesn't affect their counties. You got all these representation from all over the rest of the state. It don't affect them. It just affects a few counties. Um, we're going to start with this, uh, the damage claim itself here. And I'm just going to go through a few dates and a few things that happened. I'll try to keep it as short as possible. I do want to start uh, on the first two damage claims, the 48 and the 427. Um, once again, we've got one that, and they'll show you too, it's, they're going to call it a pasture setting. We've been to arbitration, I don't know, four or five, six times now. We've won that case in arbitration every time. The Wyoming Game and Fish has agreed to pay that, that there's no such thing as a pasture setting where we run our sheep. It's all open range. When it's grizzly bears and lions in there, these two are literally right across the creek from each other. One kill was on the south side, one kill was on the north side. And one's open range and one's a pasture setting. So they'll bring it up, but it's, it's a non-issue. They've agreed to pay that damage every year in arbitration. They didn't, don't even fight it. But here we are with that one again. But I want to move down and we're going to start on 724. And I'm just going to read a few of the actions that were taken when this damage occurred. Um, investigate only. Carcass was consumed. Set trap. Bear did not return. Investigate only. Conditions didn't allow for capture. Investigate only. Carcass was consumed. Investigate only. Carcass was consumed. Investigate only. Carcass was consumed. Investigate only. The carcass was consumed. Set traps. Bear did not return. Investigate only remote location. Investigate only the carcass was consumed. Set traps, the bear did not return. Set traps, bear was not captured. Investigate only the carcass was not consumed. So finally down here in 8-7, we finally catch one male grizzly bear. So you think we'd get a little relief. That's on the 7th of August. On the 10th of August, we had another damage. Set traps, bear did not return. On 8-10, so we're talking a matter of four days later, a second grizzly bear was captured. Well, maybe that's gonna give us some relief. No relief. On 8-13, three days later, another grizzly bear is captured. Well, surely now we've got three bears out of here. Surely we're gonna get some relief. 8-14, another kill. Investigate only, carcass was consumed. No, I'm sorry, wrong date. Um, same, th oh no. So 8-14 and 810 was the second one, 813 was the third one, and 814 was the fourth one. The next day we catch another grizzly bear, guys. Day after day after day, we're dealing with this. They don't go away. There's more bears in there than you can shake a stick at. So then on 815, guess what? The very next day we had another kill. The very next day. Action taken. Investigate only carcass was consumed. Then we go down here all the way through, I mean, set traps on the 29th, the 22nd, uh, the 30th, set traps, bear did not return. So on 8.30, the end of the month. So we've got one month here. One adult male grizzly was captured and removed. So there's the fifth one. So now we got five of them out. You think we would get a little relief? 9.3, I'm sorry, the that very next day after 8.30 and one bear was removed, then 8.31, investigate only carcass was consumed. There's another dead one. So 9.3, four days later, I caught another adult female. This happens day in and day out. Guys, every day we're dealing with this. If you don't think there's any economic damage and livestock being scattered and the time and energy and effort it takes us to deal with all of this, 
man, you don't know nothing about business. You don't know nothing about ranching. I mean, look at the fuel pump right now. What's that going to take me this summer to deal with this? So the way you've got this set up by your multipliers and this and that, it does not cover the damage. We're going to keep going. Nine three, the lat, that female was killed. Six days later, nine nine, investigate only, carcass was consumed. Nine thirteen, investigate only, carcass was consumed. Nine sixteen, set trap, bear did not return. Nine seventeen, investigate only, the carcass was not consumed. And I'm not gonna. I'm not going to bring up names. I'm not here to drag anybody under the bus. But on the 9, 16, or 17, I'm not sure which one. Um, the trapper's exact words were we had a fresh kill. And I don't know if you guys know the process, but if you get a kill, you have to get the game and fish in there immediately. They won't trap on a, on a carcass that's two or three days old because they, don't, they want to catch the target bear. And so I get a trapper in there. We've got a fresh kill from that night. He gets in there. And, guys, these are sheep. Like there's nothing left, hardly anything left to trap on. So he tells me, he's like, well, I'm not going to set a trap. I said, well, what do you mean you're not setting a trap? He said, well, there's nothing to trap on. I said, listen, I've never asked a game and fish to trap on an old carcass. I won't do it. They, I, I know the process. It's got to be a fresh carcass for them to trap the target bear. And you're going to tell me that you're going to leave this bear in here because there's not enough. And we got a fresh kill right here. So I have to lose my mind and call, go all the way up the chain. Turn this kid all the way around from Cody and come back to the ranch to set a trap. And he tells me and his exact words were, well, it's hunting season and we don't have anywhere to turn these bears out. There's nowhere to go with them because there's so many hunters in the field. We can't go dump them at a trailhead on top of hunters. And I listen, the last thing I want is somebody hurt. But then he also tells me that they're getting really close to reaching their mortality threshold and they don't want to kill any more bears because they need some space there to the end of the season. So then here I am stuck with this. And I've got to literally lose my mind trying to get a bear off my ranch. And we're talking, guys, 20 miles at least outside the designated management area, way down where they don't belong, outside of that range. And thank you to your higher-ups. They sent him back, and he set a trap. We didn't catch the bear. It keeps going, though. 928, so what's that? A few days later. Same thing, investigate only. 10-3, uh, investigate only, carcass was consumed. Goes clear into some late calves that we had. So what this is, it's nine weeks. From the start of that process to the end, it's nine weeks, 63 days. In 63 days, there's 30 affidavits. That's almost every other day. I mean, the, the, just the cost, the man hours, dispersed grazing, the sickness in livestock, six bears being removed and we still get killing uh you know just the wear and tear on our equipment back and forth not only ours but yours uh, our pregnancy rates all this adds up guys weights on yearlings weights on calves it all adds up every bit of it so it's there's 16 calves 50 head of sheep 26 of those are ewes if you kill 26 ewes they've all got lambs what happens to those lambs when their mothers are dead? They turn into a bum. What's that lamb going to weigh at the end of the year? Not near what the rest of them should. Those are the kind of things that impact a ranch. Those are the kind of things that need to be paid for. We cannot sustain this any longer. I mean, you can look at that stack of yellow affidavits. That's dead livestock, guys. You know, and I mean, there's remote locations. Uh, you know, you, you guys did a study and, and I know it's ongoing and, and they're not done with it yet. And, and it was at your last game and fish meeting, but you had, they found one calf. And they were missing 13. And it wasn't for lack of effort. Dan Thompson sat right here and told you guys that. They, they were out looking for them. It, it, it's, they're not easy to find, especially when it comes to the sheep. We literally had a piece of wool this big last year, guys. And there was a little bit of blood in the grass and a little bit of the gut pile. And that was it. That was all we found. How many of these? I mean, you, do, you don't know the owl cricks. I know I've shown videos and whatever, but it's big, remote, wild country. It's as wild a country in Wyoming as there is. Hard to get around. I mean, they would literally, when they got into these sheep for nine weeks, they would move them. 
I've got a deal up there. I've got to stay on my private property. I got two herders with them all the time. They would move them three, four, five miles at night and they'd have to go try to put them all back together. And I don't know if it was you guys and I'm pretty sure it's the Wild Sheep Foundation. They're up there flying me every two or three days, checking those sheep, watching me, making sure we stay where we're supposed to stay. So now we've got two entities that are kind of for each other, but now they're against each other because I'm trying to keep my sheep on my private property. These bears get in them for nine weeks, move them every other night, kill them every night. And they're moved four, five, six miles. And my guys got to go up there every day. They ride from daylight till dark, putting sheep back together. And then you got ewes that lost lambs or you got lambs that lost their mothers. And so they're off looking for their lambs or they're looking for their mother. They're walking constantly. They don't put weight on when they do that. All these things cost me money. Every one of them. I mean, and even with your study, I mean, Albert Summers, I mean, he, he said right there in that they're getting 15 to 20 percent loss, 10, 15 or 20 percent loss in the upper green. 20 percent guys on 2000 cows is 4000 or 400 calves. It's real. We're not making this up. People out there and the stuff that's in the media, they might think I'm a crook, but man, I'm just trying to make a living. I'm trying to give my kids a piece of ground that anybody in this room would die for to own. It's the best ranch in Wyoming. It did not have bears. It did not have wolves when we bought this ranch. They've been stuffed down our throat. They've been mismanaged. And here we are again. I got a, one case, as you guys well know, I'm sure in the Supreme Court right now. I'm going to arbitration in about two weeks on another one. Have not been paid since 2017. Missed a filing date in 2019. Guess what? You don't get paid. I'm trying to run a ranch, be a lawyer, be a dad, do everything that we're doing. And I, man, I, guys, I'm tired. I'm tired of the fight. I need some help. I need some relief. And this board has the ability and the flexibility to change that. Now, we'll see what the Supreme Court does. I mean, that last case that went to Supreme Court, I've been here. I've been to arbitration and lost. We took our whipping and we, we got paid what you wanted to pay me. So the next time we go to arbitration and we win and the Game and Fish decides to appeal the district court. So arbitration is to keep this out of court, to, to not tie up the court system with a bunch of frivolous stuff. That's why we have arbitration. Well, now they don't like it. And so now we want to get rid of arbitration. And then we want to put all these rules in that say, this is what you can and can't do. It's regulated. It's, it's garbage. The, the statutes, they don't take care of damage. And you know what? I don't know what the, I, we'll get to that. I got some answers at the end maybe that we'll get to. <clears throat> I'm going to read you another. And once again, guys, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. I think your guys, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again, Luke and his guys are as good as they get. Okay, when you guys have turnover in the game and fish department, especially the large carnivore deal, that's a tough gig to learn. Not only to do their job and do it safely so you don't kill one of your guys, which would be the absolute worst thing in the world, but to train those guys. To My ranch alone, he sends a new guy up there. They don't know where, if I say go to Lake Creek, go to Meadow Creek, Rocky Draw, Spring Creek. They don't know where that's at. So guess what I got to do? I got to lead them in there by the hand and take them and show it to them. There's, yeah, you could pin it on a GPS. They still can't get there. There's some roads you can't go on. I mean, we got to try to maintain all these roads to keep where we can get bear traps in there, as much of that ranch as we can get to. But when you have turnover, once again, it costs me money. So the guys are good. Your guys are outstanding. I don't have a bad thing to say about them. They do an excellent job and they work hard. But this is an, this is an email and it, and it deals with your study that was done up in Cody. And once again, I, I'm not, I'm not giving any names. This is an email between a department employee and one of the ranchers on that study up there. And it says at the very end of it, it says, it does look, it does look like we need to have a yearling multiplier. Also based on the results of this project, it appears that the grizzly bear calf multipliers could be increased. This is up to our commission members though. Straight out of the mouth of a game and fish employee that was highly involved in that study. It comes back to you guys. So where, where does this take us? I mean, and, and I've said it before, and I'm not saying you guys, and I'm not saying the department, but the system is a thief. You guys are thieves. They are thieves. The whole, it's broken, and I'm here to try to fix it. But they're thieves. This is what happens when the thief isn't just some of the run of the mill crook 
what happens when the thief is your government clothed in the authority of law. So you've got statutes, regulations, and bylaws that are protecting you, the game and fish. Not you personally, protecting the game and fish in your pocketbook. And I'm the one paying for it. It's costing me out of my pocketbook. I have to pay for all of this. Your laws, your regulation, and your rules are set up to where it doesn't cost you guys as much money. You're trying to save your money, but at the end of the day, it's costing me when you have this kind of damage. You had one, the one ranch didn't have any damage in Cody. One had one, maybe two, no wolf damage. And I had all, I had lion's damage, I had bear damage, and I had wolf damage too. All of them. Like we're paying for that. And I know it doesn't deal with this specifically, but we had wolves get in there and we found 14 ewes that they killed. When we got done off the mountain, we were short 67 ewes. Never found them. Dark timber, drag them off, go in the camp. I don't know where they went. Never found them. They were scattering those sheep once again. But that cost me. But at least with the wolf, I can kill the wolf. They're a predator and we can do as much work as, as we can. But I'm telling you guys, that's hard. We started in April and there was a pack of four in there and it took us all the way until October. The end of October, the fourth one finally came out of there. We thought we were going to be good, and Friday, seven to ten more should just showed up this last week. So here we go again. And that, I get that's not part of this, but it's it's part of this as a whole. So it goes back to man. We we said the pledge this morning. We got the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in this country. And I'm just trying to protect a piece of private property. And it says right here nor shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. I'm here seeking compensation. I don't have the answers. You guys, we got to do something. I'm the only one fighting this fight. Yeah, there's a few more that are standing up now fighting it, but we're getting 10 times the damage as anybody else in the country right now from these deals. So if you look at your maps, and these are just vague maps. Sorry, I couldn't put it on the projector for everybody else. But it's just bear density maps. They're all on the Wyoming Game and Fish website. You can see in the 80s, 90s, 2000, 2014, there's another map from 2018. That's the last density map I've seen. I don't know. We don't really want to keep sharing it because it's a disaster where these bears have spread. The next map, the second map, yellow is your grizzly bear recovery zone, the blue is your demographic monitoring, the DMA. And you can see they're way outside. Guys, this is my private property. You are managing grizzly bears on my private property without permission and without compensation. The compensation does not cover the loss. So the next one I want you to flip to is resident grizzly bear range and historic grizzly bear range. So as you can see, the whole state of Wyoming is in there. California, I like the idea of sending grizzly bears back to California, that'd be a great place for them. So what do we do? What do you guys do? What's the answers? I don't know. Right now you're, you're getting a lot of elk damage on the Eastern half of Wyoming. You got guys that you're, heck, I think the last model I seen or maybe it was in my packet for arbitration, you're paying as much in elk damage as you are in grizzly bear damage. I don't know if it's cornfields, fences, I'm not sure what it all is. Let's share these grizzly bears with everybody in the state and then you'll have everybody in here knocking your doors down saying, uh-uh, we're not doing this. It's historical. If we're actually in the want to Get the grizzly bear off there. Get their numbers, which they've been there since the late 90s. Let's share them with the rest of the state. Let's fill these, uh, the rest of these mountain ranges up with them. Why do we have to continue to hold them in the northwest corner? Look what your elk population's done up there. The elk are gone. I think you can see with that one map that the bears are fringing around Yellowstone. All those females are going out. There's nothing left to eat. You got wolves and bears in there both. The elk population in. From there down to the feed ground, I mean, it's diminished. And maybe that was the plan. I don't know. But if you're having all this elk trouble and you, need your, you can't get your numbers under control, give them some grizzly bears. Let the rest of the state deal with this. I mean, we, 
There's no reason why we're continuing to hold them where we're holding them. If we can't get them off the list, and, and I'll be honest, guys, even if the state gets management, are we going to solve the problem? 12 bears inside, 12 bears outside? Maybe if the state does get management, you can be a little harder on these livestock killers. I don't know. I mean, even at that, you can see that even when they're there trapping the very next day, some of these bears aren't coming in. There, there was a time during that nine weeks in there, five to seven grizzly bears around one band of sheep. They'd be killing in both bands of sheep, same nights, two different sides of the mountain. We'd see five to seven. You can ask your guys, there, were, there was a sow with two cubs in there. She'd come into the trap, turn around and walk away. They put cameras on them. It's not like they're not trying. They're trying. It's, it's not that easy to catch them. So I, I don't know. So what do we do? Well, I don't, maybe we change this multiplier. You guys have the ability to do that. You've got the flexibility. Maybe, it, maybe, it's, maybe we raise it up if it's outside the DMA. Maybe we raise it up again if it's on private property. I mean, these are some ideas for you guys to take back and try to figure this deal out. Go to the governor. I mean, you guys have all been appointed by the governor. I tell you what we need to do is we need to go to the feds. The feds need to foot the bill. If you took a poll in the United States, everybody would say, absolutely, we need to protect the grizzly bear. Then everybody in the United States needs to ante up, and that's there needs to be tax dollars spent to protect the grizzly bear and to feed them. And that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm running the bill of that on my piece of property. It's not coming out of anybody else's pocket. I get this looks like a lot of money. It's not going away. It costs us a bunch of money to continue to deal with this problem. I mean, ranchers just north of me, plumb full of grizzly bears in the grass creeks. They had their first two damages last year, first two affidavits. Now you tell me why. I don't know. I don't understand it. They're there. You know, people say, oh, they're just making up that damage. Your guys are writing these affidavits. I'm not. I've never coerced them into writing one affidavit. Wouldn't do it. I know what one looks like. I try not to call them unless I'm absolutely sure it's damage because I know it's a two and a half hour drive from the ranch from Cody. So it takes some time. And not only that, it takes our time. We've got to wait on them to get there and go show it to them and try to figure out what we've got going on. You know, and, and I would say in 10 years, we're probably as well trained at finding kills as anybody in the country. That's what we do. So we're working at it, but this is big, rough country. They're hard to find. They pack stuff off, they bury it. A lot of dark timber, steep country, over 10,000 feet up there on top where they're dragging grizzly traps trying to catch these bears. So I guess all I can say is I went to the Supreme Court. They told me there that I, that's not the route. Arbitration, that's not the route. Legislation, the Wyoming Game and Fish Commission. So I'm putting it on you guys. I need some help. I've been here before. This isn't laughing stock. This isn't me up here trying to be a bully and push my way around. And man, this is real damage. This is real money laying here on the ground. It costs us an absolute fortune to deal with this day in and day out all summer long. I appreciate your time. If you have any questions, I'd try to answer them. I have a few questions till the end. If we okay. That's after we both take both night. Okay, at this time, we'll have Luke Ellsbury come up and present the department's investigation. Uh, President Roberts, members of the commission, direct, Director Nesbick, um, I got a pretty short presentation just go over numbers and the claim itself um, try and kind of put it all together where the differences lie between uh, the claim and the department's recommendation so let's start I can get her going there we go just kind of overview Mr. Longwell's claim um, a little bit with his numbers and then uh, work through the differences and then the department's recommendation so you see here, Mr. Longwell's claimed um, it was for 76 missing calves at, at 1,100 bucks a head for 88,623. 
um, 50 head of missing heifer calves at $936 for 46,800. Um, 178 missing lambs for $48,460. 117 missing ewes for $52,650. And then you get his total claim of $200,036,544. So part of this claim, um, or this claim was for just his missing livestock and actually didn't include any of the livestock that was actually verified by the department. So nothing that we, we actually looked at. Um, and also there was no factors and formulas uh, according to regulation for lawful compensation. And we derived that um, from his claim affidavit itself. You see, um, if I can point it out, this box here is where they claim they're missing and verified livestock. So you see the 126 calves here and the 295 sheep. Um, and he attached his math separately from the claim. Um, here on a separate paper. And, and so we were able to figure out that it was just for the missing and not the verified there. So to, to figure out lawful compensation using factors and formulas, we have to look at commission regulation, chapter 28, section 3A. Um, this directs the department what sort of um, factors, formulas, um, or what sort of areas we can we can apply those um, and i'll just i know you guys have heard this before but i'll read it if anybody knew real quick um, in geographic areas determined by the department to have terrain topography and vegetative characteristics that influence the ability of the claimant and the department to find missing calves and sheep and um, that are believed to have been damaged as a result of trophy game animal gray wolf in accordance with statute 23-1-901 uh, the department shall utilize the methods, factors, and formulas in this subsection to determine the amount to compensate any landowner, leasee, or agent for calves and sheep missing as a result of such damage. So if we look at what we did verify and what we can apply, and, and so we use that regulation, I should say, um, we term that open range versus pasture. So anything that applies to those to terrain, topography, vegetative characteristics would be considered open range versus a fenced in hay pasture or small pasture something like that um, if we look at grizzly bear damage we verified uh, three steer calves in open range and, and all the grizzly bear damage was open range um, one heifer calf and then six unknown calves unknown sex and that's usually hides we find um, as the carcass has been completely consumed and it'll have punctures bruising trauma in the hide that would lead us to believe more likely than not that it was killed by a grizzly bear, um, which is the um, is what the standard we use per regulation. Um, we also had 18 ewes verified and 13 lambs. And then for mountain lions, we had 11 lambs, seven ewes, and then one ewe that was verified in a pasture setting. So if we move further down in chapter 28, section three, um, it gives us the number that we can use to multiply to, to cover for missing animals. Um, and it's number of calves, individual calves or sheep that are confirmed by the department or its representative as being killed by a black bear, grizzly bear, or mountain lion multiplied by three and a half, multiplied by the value of the livestock, which equals the amount of compensation. So the numbers come to, if we, we take all those animals, that were verified in open range and the one in the pasture setting, we can multiply the open range animals by three and a half, which gives us 35 calves, 88 and a half ewes, and 84 lambs. If we compare that to the numbers that were um, claimed by Mr. Longwell, we see there's some pretty big differences. Uh, 126 calves claimed versus the 35 that we can award per regulation for a difference of 91 calves. Um, 117 ewes claimed uh, versus the 88 and a half that we came up out of regulation for a difference of 28 and a half calves or ewes, excuse me. Um, and then 178 lambs versus the 84 recommended by the department for a difference of 94 lambs. So the department award or approved award for grizzly bear damage, we took the six unknown calves and divided those equally between the steer calves and the heifer calves. 
um, multiplied six steer calves, the three verified and three unknown, times the three and a half times price per head for $24,488. Four heifer calves, which is the one verified plus three of the unknowns, times three and a half for $13,000. $106. 18 U's times the three and a half times $450 a head for $28,350. And 13 lambs times three and a half times $272 for $12,387. So the total grizzly bear damage awarded was $78,332. Um, all of these were uh, all the grizzly bear damage was eligible for the multiplier um, due to terrain topography and the areas that they were found. Mountain lion damage, um, pretty much all of the sheep were eligible for multiplier except for the one ewe that was found on a pasture setting. Um, so we have 11 lambs at three times three and a half at the price per head for 10,000. $481, seven U's times three and a half times 450 per head for $11,025 and one U in the pasture setting for just $450. So the total mountain lion damage is $21,956. So just the final summary comparison between uh, the department and the, the claimant summary. Um, you see grizzly bear damage to calves, um, pretty big difference, a difference of $97,838. Um, grizzly bear damage to sheep, we had a difference of $11,912. Uh, mountain lion damage to sheep, uh, or yeah, excuse me, uh, $26,503. So a, a total difference of $136,255. So the total, total award from the department is $100,288.89. So with that, I'd take any questions that the commission may have. I got one. On this particular area, uh, how many bears are we dealing with up there? I mean, it's really hard to put an exact number to it, um, but there are, there are a lot of bears in that area. I, I'd agree with Josh on that. <clears throat> How is it compared to other areas? You know, it, it's pretty comparable, pretty much all the way from the state line down. Um, even outside of the DMA, we have ranches um, comparable as size and terrain as his that that'll harbor quite a few bears. Yeah. I'm trying to figure how many. I mean, quite a few. I'm. I. What? What's quite a few? Kind of. He is. Boy, it's hard to say. So our. You know, ecosystem wide, the estimate is a little over a thousand bears now. Um, outside of the, and that's just within the DMA. So the bears outside of the DMA aren't counted. And uh, I would say, if, you know, from the state line down to through the Owl Creeks, there may be as many as 100 or 200 bears outside the DMA. So, thank you. Mr. President. Sure. And I'm just curious of those bears that were captured. Are they just moved somewhere else or are they destroyed? So of the five bears caught last year, four of them were destroyed and one was relocated. How do you decide that? Um, it's typically up to the Fish and Wildlife Service. We'll make a recommendation um, depending on age of the bear, uh, the conflict, um, suitable areas to put them time of year. And ultimately the Fish and Wildlife Service makes the de decision. I'm also curious in the mountain lion, if there is it like an unlimited season or so it, in the owl creeks it's a year-round season um it has a harvest limit of i believe 18 lions which typically isn't met um so it stays open year-round however if it, we do capture a lion doing damage in there um, they're automatically removed we don't relocate those thank you mr president luke um how much time does the department spend on Mr. Longwell's trying to mitigate some of these losses. I mean, there's manpower and I mean, it, it appears that we, you guys spend an awful lot of time there. We do. Um, I, I would have to go look, but I, I would venture to say, um, you know, a couple of weeks worth of time for at least a guy or two down there um, at the minimum. So it, I think um, I'll, 
last year was probably more than normal. Um, felt like we had a guy in there for about a month and a half solid. So. And, man, and um, you mentioned there's there's bears along that whole range, from That's north, north to south. Sure. Are and Mr. Longwell, of course, I've seen him for four or five years. Um, has continually the same type of claims year in and year out. And are, are we? Is there anything we can do? Is there any any mitigation efforts that can be done? Uh, maybe they already are as far as trying to minimize that loss as much as possible? You know, as far as what the department can do, I think um, we are doing what we can. Um, we try and make sure that we're in there as fast as we can to deal with the problem if we can. Um, if it's a spot we can set traps or do what we can, uh, making sure that we're verifying livestock. Um, as far as you know, management of the livestock itself, I think would fall on the, on the management of the ranch and not the department. You listed a lot of different things. I mean, are there other things that we help ranchers with as far as um, other types of techniques? I've, I've talked to some of the other fellows that, that deal with grizzly bears and uh, they talk about riders and a whole variety of different things and with, you know, varied success. Um, depending on the species, riders don't matter as much as far as grizzly bear because most of it's done at night, uh, those types of things. But, uh, you know, they're talking about these call, new collars to put on sheep and a variety of different things. I mean, what's out there for a rancher to use uh, that we try to help them with to, to try to mitigate these losses and try to prevent them? There are, for the sheep, um, one of the big things that's been used in the past um, and the department has helped in, in certain herds um, is night penning. Um, you kind of have to get the sheep used to it. Um, some sheep do good in it, some don't. Um, there's also, you know, in smaller settings, electric fence works great in certain areas. Um, you know, we, we could, we do have programs to electric fence certain pastures, um, which has had pretty good success. Um, but then again, it, it's size dependent. Um, I know some guys have had some good success with flagery, that sort of thing, or um, noisemakers, lights, but all of it is, other than electric fence, is somewhat temporary as animals will get used to that over time. Um, but yeah, it, riders work good. Uh, some of the other producers in the Cody area, at least, have, have gone to using more riders, one, to find kills, but also to just keep a presence on the, the landscape. And, a lot of times that it's a double-edged sword because when a bear is killing, um, when they're actively looking for kills, they may bump the bear. And that may be why we don't have as good a success sometimes as we'd like to as far as trapping the bear. But um, also we see the missing livestock go down in those situations too. No, Mr. President, um, I'll get back on what I wanted to ask you about. Uh, <clears throat> As far as, uh, you know, he, Mr. Longwell is correct. I mean, we, we as a commission, we could adjust multipliers. We can do a lot of different things. Um, and I don't have a problem with, with studying and looking at methodology on our damage program on a periodic basis. I don't have a problem with that. I think that's, that's good business, so to speak. But if we were to get authority over the bears, of which we currently do not manage, we monitor basically, is all we do. Uh, if, if we were to have that ability, how do you think that would have any impact on a situation like Mr. Longwell and others? I, I tend to agree with them. I, I don't think it's gonna have the tremendous amount of impact other than the fact that when we have troubled bears, we can do more with them. Uh, we don't have to get permission, but what, what, what's your opinion on if we had the authority to manage bears, what we would be able to do? You know, I, we already, try and target conflict bears. So I don't see much of that changing on that end. As far as allowing a hunting season, um, you know, there, there's a lot of bears on the landscape now. And um, to be able to hunt in the numbers that we would need to, to affect any sort of conflict, I, I don't foresee that changing or being high enough. Um, just, just out of the conservation need for the species itself. Outside of the DMA, um, it would depend on what the state allows for harvest outside. Um, and it also 
depend on landowner access too. Um, that, that's always a big thing with any conflict. If we look at elk, grizzly bears, um, any of it, if, if there's not access to get to them or good access to get to them, it's not gonna be effective. One of my questions is, you know, you have such a large disparity between the, the numbers uh, and what Mr. Longwell saying and what the department's verified. And, and I'm not a rancher, of course, and, um, and I don't know in the ranching business what's attributed to other kinds of loss besides grizzly bear, whether it's disease or just whatever they do. And, and I don't know, um, is, is there any kind of a, without going into anybody's freedoms or anything, kind of an on and an off because I have no numbers, you know, I don't have any, uh, is there an on count and an off count? And, and the ranchers I'm sure have it, but it, can, can we address that a little bit? Commissioner Roberts, members of the commission. So we don't require an on count and off count. And so that is why we use a multiplier for what we verify. So um, we use that off count or we use their, what they're missing to apply that multiplier to, um, but we are, we're, we're taking their word for that. And so we're not requiring at this time an on count or an off count um, of what's on the landscape. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. It, Mr. Longwell, is it, is it something that if you could address it also, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, <clears throat> great question. So what we do, and I, you know, everybody's different, but mine's a branding count. When we brand in the spring, we've got to count on calves that we've branded. That next count comes when we come off the mountain and we wean those calves. I've got a branding count and a weaning count. So what, and we will have some late calves. So then I've also got a count in there that's branded calves in the fall that didn't get branded in the spring. So those counts are in effect there. Same thing with the sheep. And so these death losses at birth, I mean, those are five to 6% at, at birth, whether it's lambs, calves, whatever. My count on my sheep is at a docking. So when you cut their tails and you put a paint brand on a, on a little bitty lamb in the spring, that's that count. Same thing when they come off the mountain in the fall, we get a weaning count. Those were the, that's where the numbers come from. It's everything's from either docking or branding to weaning in the fall. The, the ewes were counted. So when they come off the mountain, we wean the lambs, we, we process everything. They get shots, they get wormer, they get, you know, all their vaccinations. <clears throat> the wolf deal was actually after. So luckily we didn't have lambs on the mountain when the wolves found them. So that's a completely different count this last year. Um, and as Luke can tell you, this thing's so wide open from one end to the other one year down in the meadows. And we, some of you guys have dealt with it, but I mean, we'd get astronomical killing when they're lambing. Like I'm talking hundreds of lambs. Like, I mean, one night we had grizzly bears, black bears, wolves, and mountain lions in those sheep when they were lambing. I mean, piles of dead lambs last year, we were fortunate enough. The bears didn't come down low early in the spring. Oh, Saturday, we've got one coming down already. We got, we've seen four different tracks out coming down the creek as we speak. Um, so it just differs. Like this year, most of that sheep killing was up high, but some years it's all down low. Like this, I mean, you're talking a huge ranch from top to bottom from 4,000 feet elevation to 10, 11,000 feet elevation. And every aspect of range in between from high mountain to high desert to sagebrush to big draws, canyons. I mean, you name it, it's in there. Um, but yeah, those are where the counts come from. That's how we count our stuff is, is a branding and a docking in the spring and then a weaning in the fall. Um, that's where those numbers come from. What, what would be your suggestion on what the, as far as the numbers are concerned and how to go about as that? far as, as far as um, the grizzly bear? Well, as far as, as far as on, on the damages, what would, what would you consider to be fair? So, on the so here, here's the problem with all of this. And that's why I bring up weights. That's why, I mean, the bum lambs, bum lambs is a great, I mean, 26 head of ewes, let's say, you know, maybe not all of them had two lambs. So maybe half of them. So you're talking 35, 40 lambs. Those 40 lambs are not going to weigh, but the lamb weighs that still fed on its mother to the rest of the grazing season. Same thing. I mean, so then you got ewes that also lose lambs. So they're, they're, they're stress related. Um, and I'll, I'm trying to keep it short, but I'll, my neighbors had a guard dog on the other side of the county. And when they got ready to turn their bucks in to breed their ewes, they had a guard dog that was harassing those sheep. They had more open ewes this year because of one guard dog. One guard dog, they had, 
a pile of open ewes that was harassing those sheep when they were trying to breed them. They figured it out. They killed the dog, got rid of them, but it was too late. It's the same thing with cows and sheep. If they get stressed and harassed, and I've shown you in the video, I think it was last year, maybe two years ago, we, we were just up there actually looking for lions to try to get them out of there before the sheep came. And here, all the cows are running off the mountain. Like just, and I'm talking streams of cows running off the mountain. So I, video, I just take my phone out and I take pictures of everything now. But I got my video out and, you, and it's, they run off the mountain. Well, we keep riding up the drainage and sure enough, we jumped the bear off a fresh calf kill. So we call Luke, wait for him to come up there. But that, they disperse livestock and move them. So your weight, your pregnancy rates. The difference between a pregnant cow and an open cow is almost a thousand dollars just as an average. And so that's what's not taken into consideration on whether it's a multiplier, whether it's, I mean, there's just so many things that aren't compensated for that. But the only way to fill out your guys's paperwork is either a multiplier on deaths or missing livestock. Like I'm trying to figure out how to get paid. I can't write in there. Okay. We had this many extra hours for bear damage. We had this many extra hours for, we had this many open cows that cost me this much. We had, we were off. I mean, you take 10 or 15 pounds on five, 600 yearling steers. That's a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, it, it all adds up. It's the economics, the way you guys are set up to fill out a damage claim. It, it once again, your rules, your bylaws, your statutes, they tie my hands, just like the feds tie their hands. These guys are doing all they can to get these bears out of here, but they, 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 they got to follow the rules too. And they got to call the feds. And so when we were having in the process of all this nine weeks of killing, and I'm talking day in and day out, we were up there, they were up there. I mean, I put these guys up in my cabin on the mountain so they don't have to drive back and forth. Because once you hit the end of the pavement, it's a two to two and a half hour drive to the top of the mountain on a rough road. They leave bear traps all over the ranch in the summer so they don't have to drag them around. Like we're trying to help them as much as we can. And they're trying to help us as much as they can. But their hands are tied when it comes to dealing with these bears. So what I did, I called the feds. I called Hillary in Missoula. She's the head bear lady for the fish and wildlife. And it's in your, in your guys' statute, it says you can ask for a kill permit. So I went to these guys and they're like, that's out of our hands. We can't issue a kill permit. So I called the feds. I'm like, hey, this is what's going on. We got a, a sow and two cubs and then all these extra bears around her and they're all killing the sow and two cubs would come in. They've got pictures of her. She'd come to the trap. With them little bitty cubs, guys, we're talking cub of the year. She ain't going in a live trap. She won't do it. So she walks away, and here comes the next one. We catch five of them that way, but we never catch her. We see, Visually, these guys seen her. I seen her three times. She was right there. I mean, they just, there's, and I, I don't know the numbers. They say 1,000 bears inside. I think that's crazy. I think you're at least 1,500 to 1,800. Outside, several hundred, if not 500. There is more grizzly bear. They can't count them. There's, and you know that. They've said that. There's no good way to count them. They can count the moss sites when they're up above timberline digging for moss. And I, I mean, the last count, maybe it was two years ago, 78 or 84, whatever it was, on the two, the Washakie Needle and Duck Mountain, Frank's Peak had 50 or 60, whatever it was. Once the moth hatch goes away, all those bears have to come down drainages. There's nowhere else to go up. They all got to come down. So the owl cricks, the wood, I mean, that, that's where they go. That's where they disperse to. And so you got sows and cubs that probably don't take their babies up there because then boars are going to kill them. So they're down and out of there. The one bear that was, one of the bears that was caught this year was a female. And correct me if I'm wrong, Luke, but we caught that bear two years ago. Caught that bear two years ago killing sheep. She left. It was, well, no, that wasn't even fall, probably late summer. Anyway, she came back and has been on the ranch following those sheep. We've had her telemetry at other lamb or sheep kills and caught other bears besides her, but she was right there. We finally get her caught again, but here she's, and same thing, uh, this bear that we caught, the one bear that we did catch this year, I believe she came back too, or he did, whichever it was. Like, guys, this is 10 years and it's mind boggling and I've got four cases going. I can't keep up with it. Like, my mind gets caught up in different things that different happen. I mean, it, but it's every day. You know, I think it was two years ago. Maybe that's one that's going to the commission. We had two calves killed and a yearling steer killed in the same drainage, three to four miles apart. Sow and cub come into the live trap and a foot snare. Cub gets in the foot snare and pulls out. Sow and cub are gone. So we pull the equipment. The one where it killed two calves, there's a bear in the trap when we get there that morning. So we go on and check the other traps. When we come back to pick the trap up to haul the bear out, we got another grizzly bear circling the trap trying to get in. They take all their equipment. 
they catch one bear and leave. And I'm stuck with three more bears. We know are in there outside the, well, the sound cub was pretty, she was probably inside, I guess. Outside the DMA with this, we just leave this other bear. Oh, we got the target, kill him again. And one of those calves, and it's, it's not this year, but one of those calves was bit and its whole ear ripped off and all of its skin down, but not one puncture went. So that bear that was running around the trap was a young bear. It was a smaller bear. The one in the trap was a big boar. Whether that calf got away or what, we find it dead less than a mile from the other one that's, I don't get paid for that calf. There's no puncture holes in it. You tell me what takes an ear and rips the hide all the way back down its neck and into its back and rips it off. Calf, who knows, it might've went three miles. It could have been two days before that. It finally dies, we find it, but there's no holes in it. So guess what? I don't get paid. Last summer, and it's once again, guys, it's not Luke's fault. He's doing the best he can with his hands tied behind his back trying to do this deal. But we find a calf. I take pictures of it. I mean, we're clear up in the mountains. There's no corrals. There's very few roads. We see the calf. He's on the other end of the ranch setting traps, trying to catch bears. I'm like, hey, when you get done, let's go over here. We got another trap on this side. Found a calf that's got bites all over his back. We never found the calf again. Never found him. Nowhere to go with him. Nowhere to. Well, you, we could rope him and tie him up for two days until I can get someone in there to look at him. I can take pictures, but that we can't, they can't verify off a picture. It's, it's guys, it's stuff like this all the time, all summer long. The multiplier is, is not set up to cover all the damage. Heck, it, you can see it doesn't, even co it doesn't even cover the missing livestock, but I don't know how any other way to fill out a damage claim to try to get compensated for what's going on up here. Once again, my hands are tied with your rules and your regulation and the forms I got to fill out to try to get paid. You know, you look at this, oh my gosh, that's 150,000 more. Heck, I got 100,000 just in weights and yearlings and alone. I probably, there's probably another 100,000 in open cows and open heifers. When they get stressed, they don't breed. When they get run all over that ranch, we got all kinds of mountain country. We can't keep them up there. I mean, that high country leads right into the two biggest peaks in the county. And that's where the moss sites are. And that's where the bears are going and coming from. They run out of food. And, and you know, I think maybe it's a different landscape than, I, than grass creek even is. But we're a, we're a more high, dry, arid. As soon as it starts drying out, then bears are done with the grass. I mean, you can almost tell instantly. As soon as that grass gets to where it breaks over and it starts getting crinkly and hard, they're done. And that's when the killing starts. So my other option is, well, keep your cows out of there. What good's a ranch if you can't put cattle and sheep on it? Once again, guys, this is mostly private property. I mean, we, we pay a fortune in property tax. You know, they raise my taxes to build a new hospital. They raise your taxes for this, they, your costs of everything. I mean, you guys, everybody's seen it. inflation's going through the roof. Everything's going to cost me more. And as you can see, the pattern is 10 years down the road, the damage just continues to go up. This study was done in the 1990s on this three and a half multiplier. It wasn't enough then and it dang sure ain't enough today. I don't know what it looks like. I, I don't know if you, maybe you reach a third, certain threshold of killing and then, then the multiplier goes up. I, I mean, that's flexibility and you guys is, I mean, get your minds together and ideas and I don't, but we got to have some help is all I'm saying. Like it's, uh, I'm, man, I'm tired of fighting this fight alone. I, I'm, we fought it through the court system and, and, and I'm going to bring it up and maybe I shouldn't, I don't know. But so when this decision last year gets appealed, we win an arbitration. Like I said before, we, when we lost an arbitration, we took our payment and we walked away, but we keep fighting. So the next step is we go to arbitration again and I win that case and they won't pay me. And then that year it was 440 or $50,000. Game and Fish wanted to pay me a hundred thousand. The, ar the arbitrators ruled that I should be paid three hundred and forty thousand. Don't get paid. So then they appeal it. So it's supposed to come to Hot Springs County to district court in the local county that the damage happened in. Same thing with arbitration it has to happen in Hot Springs County with local residents that hear this case. So I walk in there and tell them everything I'm telling you, and they look at it and say, "Wow, these guys are getting eat out of house and home." Yeah, they deserve. They didn't give me everything I asked for, but they gave me more than what you wanted to give. So then we appeal it. So then it's supposed to come back to district court in Hot Springs County. And, and this is where the bureaucracy and the garbage that just infuriates me is they've either coerced my district court and she's a young gal that she can't hear that case. 
So she says she has a conflict of interest, which I've never been in front of her. My father-in-law's never been in front of her. We've never used her as a lawyer. She gets coerced into sending that thing off. Well, guess where it ends up? It ends up in Cody. And I don't have a problem with Judge Simpson. I don't even know the guy. But I, know, I do know he's a friend of the state of Wyoming. He's heavily involved in politics. He's an advocate for bears. And so he gets the case. Well, yeah, yeah he's going to write up. Yeah, they, no, we can't do this. So then we take it to the Supreme Court. And who knows what's going to happen there. But one of their questions is, if we're doing this, and, we, and the, they can't raise the multiplier, or they can't pay these guys, what in the world good is arbitration for? Arbitration is supposed to keep this crap out of these higher courts so it don't boggle them down with all these, this frivolous stuff. So we follow the process, and it works in your benefit. And then when it don't work in your benefit, the next thing you know, you, you guys appeal it and then get it to in front of a judge that you like. And I'm not saying you guys. I'm not pointing fingers at you guys. I'm the system is broken. I mean, and, and I try to fight this all by myself because lawyers are expensive. You guys know. Heck, you got a bunch of them in here. I'm sure you're paying. First month, I had a lawyer, $13,000 bill. $13,000, and I still ain't been paid since 2017, guys. Like, it, it, it's just killing us. Just to try to run her a cow or sheep on your own private property, and everything you face is a freaking fight. We're tired of fighting. We need some help, and you guys are in a position where you can help. Raise that multiplier, pay me that money, and then tell them, go to the feds. Hey, this is what it's costing us for the bear damage because they're exploding. We can't get them off the list. The feds need to foot the bill. I agree. I, I mean, but I can't do it alone. I, I sent those letters to every legislator, every group, every representative, and I got six phone calls back. Told them the whole story, left my email, left a phone number, and said, hey, give us a shout. Like, let's, let's get you filled in. The six that called me were, I mean, they were flabbergasted by it, had no idea what was going on. I mean, even just like you guys asking these questions to loop the process and the feds and what they have, the hoops they have to jump through just to trap a bear. And then once they catch a bear, what they can or can't do with it. It's not the state's idea to not kill these bears or get rid of them when they're livestock killers. It goes, they're making the decision they need to pay for it. And it's just, I mean, guys, it's just going to get worse. If we don't get the, and I, I agree with you. Like it's, I mean, even even if they said 20 outside the DMA, I mean, that's a big area. You're not going to, you're not going to take enough density of bears outside in one area to do it that much justice. I mean, you can see they took five bears out and continued to get killing. So, and the next step that's going to happen and, and God forbid, but guys, I got guys on the ground. I got riders. I got herders. I got, I, I've shown you the pictures. They come right into their sheep camps. One of my guys is going to get hurt or killed. Then who's responsible? Mr. President, I think you, you probably agree with me. I mean, we're not going to solve your grizzly bear problem. No. Even if, if the magic wand is, is raised tomorrow and we have authority again, we're not going to solve your grizzly bear problem. Uh, it's just not going to happen. So, I mean, I mean, that's something you're going to have to live with for as long as you want to be there. But your beef with us is our multiplier and how that works, that, that conversation. So as far as, you know, it is telling us that, you know, these are our bears and we have to do all that stuff. We can't, we just can't. And, and I think you realize that. Absolutely. I know you don't like it. No. I don't like it either. There's stuff down my throat. But it's the way it is. And, you know, you've got a beautiful piece of property. It's wonderful. You know, it's a jewel of the 40, lower 48. But you got grizzly bears. Yes, sir. And you're going to have them forever. Yes, sir. So what? So, what I'm so I don't have necessarily have a problem with us evaluating periodically any of our methodology on any of our damage claims. One of the problems I have with this is you happen to be the only one we have a problem with this. We deal with a lot of people and a lot of damage claims, and 99.9% .9 of those we never see. We never see. And, and it, to me, it's obviously, I mean, I frustrating as hell to you but it's frustrating to us as well because it works for a large number of people a large number of operations and you're wanting us to adjust our program to fit and i'm not saying i'm not willing to listen and look into it because i think we should look at all our stuff all the time but we are still dealing with one problem it's a huge problem i'm not denying that i'm not belittling it. i'm not lessening your your pain and anguish 
but we have to consider the whole state as, as a whole as well. And, and I completely understand that. And that's where I'm asking for some flexibility or something. And, and I, they, I'm, come I'm, in go, here with I'm going to make a motion to, like... to adopt what the department recommended, but I, but that. I don't have a problem also directing the department. I think they're already looking into it. You are. Is, is, is multipliers. And we, we're looking at a lot of other things with our damage process right now as well. Uh, we should we need to be fair but on the other hand name a state that does a better job at it than we do uh, you, know, you could be in some other states now dealing with grizzly bears and you're all by yourself you think you're all by yourself now go to one of these other states and deal with it so i'm not i'm not excusing or saying that you should be grateful or anything like that it's just that our program works pretty well uh, could we adjust me maybe we'll see but um, i just wanted to, to let you know that and so, and uh, and I completely understand that. I don't know how many other guys you got in here getting a hundred thousand dollars for grizzly bear and lion, and and if it was a one-time deal, hey, I get it. This is ten years. I, I realize and I, I that's fully where I'm at. That. Like, and I, do I understand why I'm the only one in this drainage? In this, I mean, my neighbors to the north. My, I mean, you know, some of the neighbors in Owl Creek, they got a handful of cows, and we surround them. Well, so you know, we, I don't mind working with you, Josh, but. Let's work on what we can work on and not accuse us and blame us for all these bears and all this other stuff. I mean, we all got to live with them too. You know, people got to recreate with them. There's people coming to the bighorns now just to recreate because they don't want to deal with grizzly bears. It had nothing to do with livestock. Uh, you know, it, it's changing a whole lot of culture in the state. And unfortunately, no matter what happens, we're going to deal with grizzly bears. Well, all I can ask is that you, maybe it's case by case. I mean, Thank you. Nobody has this much damage. And so that's all I'm asking you look into it. We need to do something and maybe I'm the only one. And that doesn't mean that we wouldn't do it just because one person, I mean, we change a lot of things sometimes just because one person makes a suggestion. So it's not necessarily a numbers thing, but on the other hand, you are the only one. So, well, I appreciate your time. Is there any more questions? I, Mr. President? I do. Yes, go ahead. I, I was wanting to ask, uh, the, the term missing calves, missing lambs, missing sheep. Uh, I was raised on a ranch and I know there's a natural death loss. Has that been figured in or, cause you're talking about apparently some pretty rough country. Yes, sir. Uh, there could be some uh, natural death loss up there. Uh, absolutely. But what I understand is that you count on and you count off or you count branding and weaning. Uh, how, how do you, how do we figure where maybe there's some natural loss in here that would lower those numbers a little bit because so, it's na nature causing that? Absolutely. There's going to be some natural death, but that's the only way I have to file for a damage claim. Once again, the paperwork and the statutes and the regulations tie me to missing and verified. They don't have anything in there on weights, open cows. So that's the only way I can recoup any of this back and have a chance at trying to get some of it back. There's nothing in there to recuperate the rest of the, yeah, you're going to have some natural cause. Yeah. You're going to might be on. So the sheep, there could be a coyote killer. There's a few of those, but those are the hard numbers I have. And the only way I can fill out a damage claim without putting in there, I lost a, you know, instead of being, you know, maybe 10 or 12%. Now I'm 18 to 20% open cow rate because those cows have been moved up and down the mountain all summer long. Your three-year-olds, especially those young cows have a hard time anyway. But there's no way to get compensated for that when they're moving livestock for nine weeks in the summer, all summer long. Like, I don't, I don't know any other way. So that's, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's going to be some, could be some natural death loss, but. Thank you. President Roberts, Commissioner Ladwig. Uh, I may be able to add a little bit to that. And so. You know, we, we, we only pay for trophy game loss or big game loss on crops. And so that's part of where the multiplier comes in. So we go and verify one and we know there's going to be lots of causes. Like Josh said, you're moving them around. There could be a lot of causes for things to come up missing. And I can have Brian come up and he can talk about some natural mortality stuff. But what we're looking for on that missing number and why we have it in the, in the regulation is that we're not going to pay for more than what's missing. So if, if we verified one dead cow and at the end of the year, which would never happen, Josh was only missing two, we're not going to pay more than the two dead cows. So we're not going to pay the multiplier. But as long as he's missing more than what the multiplier covers, 
then we're assuming that he's missing some others for some other reasons as well. But for every one that we can find and verify that's killed by trophy game, there's probably three and a half others that were also killed by trophy game. And there may be others that were missing for other reasons. And so we, we have them put that total missing on there so that we can address that we're not overpaying based on the multiplier. Uh, for example, wolves, we pay a multiplier of seven. So we don't want to overpay what he's missing. But at the same time, we can't account for everything that would cause him to be missing. There may be sick ones, there may be injuries and fences, there may be falling off a cliff, you know, that country's pretty rough. So there could be a number of other things. And I can have Brian come up and, and talk about natural mortality if you want. But but that's what we're that's what we're trying to cover is that we don't want to pay them more than that's missing, but at the same time, we recognize that for every one that we verify, there's probably three and a half that were killed by trophy game animals. And I, I thank you. I understand that, but there's such a difference between what Mr. Longwell is claiming and what we're verifying, even with the additive, there's a tremendous difference there. And, and somewhere, some of that's got to be absorbed. Sure. Commissioner, uh, President Roberts, Commissioner Ladwig, I'll have Brian come up and he can talk. Yeah. Uh, President Roberts, member of the commission, Director Nesvik. So there is actually on the box, one of the boxes that, that Luke showed, there is a, um, a blank in there, and it's in the claim in front of you as well for losses other than verified trophy game. And that's basically the natural death, you know, or, you know, if we know something was hit by a vehicle or whatever. Um, any other causes that are known other than trophy game losses, that's in there. You okay. know, had you were doctoring something for pneumonia and didn't make it, that is in there. So, um, and as far as, and, and that's separate from, you know, we start talking about weight loss, we start talking about fuel, I mean, all these other costs. Yeah, granted, that's the cost of doing business. Um, you know, but the folks who, wrote these laws and regulations years ago. I mean, they're old time ranchers. They were all, they had a ranching background and they realized that these indirect costs were basically impossible to quantify. And, and that's basically what Josh said. You know, it's, it's hard to, to account for every single um, cost associated with doing this business. And so that's why the regulation is written specifically that that's not paid for. It's very clear in the regulation that direct losses from trophy game animals are what's paid for. Then we did modify that, the commission um, throughout history to, you know, there was a 1.67 factor, then it was bumped up to 3.5. The wolf is seven, and anyway, you're all familiar with that, but um, that's above and beyond um, what was actually verified, but still presumed to be a direct result of what is killed by a trophy game animal. And so that's legally what we're obligated to pay. And those are the factors that Luke used in the investigation report to come up with his numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, I have some questions for Mr. Longwell. How much is this private property versus forest permits? Uh, I have one forest permit is all I have up there. So you're mostly private property. Well, and there's a lot of BLM. So it's okay. about 90,000 deeded and 60,000 state BLM and the little piece of forest we have up there. You mentioned earlier also that you have riders. My concern, without a doubt, you have tremendous damage. We need to, I, I'm concerned with the the discrepancy between what you say is missing and what we verify. I think that number should be much tighter. What would be some suggestions you would have? How can we verify more livestock loss? I mean, I guess you can add more riders, but the more riders you get, the more it costs. Um, I know, uh, I think, believe it's wildlife services puts on some summertime temp help. They do a lot of electric fencing, things like that. They do hire some riders to ride in that country and do, um, I would agree with Luke a little bit. Sometimes you end up bumping those bears once in a while. They turn pretty nocturnal in the summertime when it's hot like that. So all the kill and all the damage happens at night. Um, you know, we do use guard dogs. They do the best they can, but 
man, when you got five to seven grizzly bears in one band of sheep, I don't know what you're going to do. Um, that's why I called the feds, asked for a kill permit. They could bring a helicopter and airplane in when she's leaving the sheep in the morning, take her out. Would not give me the kill permit or, and it wouldn't be me. Like I wouldn't be the one up there killing the bear. It would either be these guys or wildlife services. Um, but yeah, it's just rough country. Like I, I, I mean, I can't, it's until you've seen it and been in it and you've been on the ground, like these guys hike their tails off trying to find, you know, you might see birds across the ridge. You walk all the way over there. You can't find anything. Or if you do like I said, it might be a blood splot in the grass about that big and there's nothing else. I mean, th those lambs, they'll pack them off. You know, at the end of the year, they're a hundred pounds. You go up there in the summer, you're talking 40, 50, 60 pounds. I think pack those lambs off plum easy. I mean, you're talking big, dark timber draws, creek bottoms. I mean, it, it, we, we do the best we can to try to ride that ranch, you know, limited road access. Um, but you could hire guys to ride a horseback every day and probably still wouldn't find them. It's, uh, you know, it, it's tough. It, it is tough. It's, and I get it. I'm in a unique situation. I've said that before. And when this first started and I think in 12, it was maybe a couple verified claims, two or three or, but it's just substantially grown to where we've outgrown the three and a half. It's, it just doesn't cover. There's no way to cover all these other costs. I mean, those cows used to kick them up to the mountain. You couldn't get them down until it snowed. Now we can't even get them up there. They get up there and get hit by a bear. They're, they come rolling off the mountain. And once again, I mean, and I brought all this up before, but then they go to my fall feed. So then now they're eating all my fall feed in the middle of the summer when they're supposed to be up high on the mountain. So we got a bunch of resource and grass up there. We don't, we can't even use, can't even keep them up there. I mean, you trail them up day after day after day, trying to keep them on the mountain. So then that means we got to come off our fall feed and go to winter range early. So then I've got to buy feed to try to get them fed out through the rest of the winter like there's just it's a snowball effect mm -hmm. when the damage becomes this much every year um i get it it's it's we are in a tough spot i'm in a tough spot you guys <laughs> i get i'm one guy in a big old state but it's historical it's 10 years of it and it's just it gets worse every year and so all i'd ask is look at it i agree you know you're gonna have to do what you have to do and but the laws and the rules and the regulations are set up where they don't cover all the costs. And I'm incurring and taking care of all of those at this point. So I'm just asking for some help. Do what you can. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Any other questions? So in summary, you know, the regulation allows us to pay for direct damage to trophy game. Um, based on, I'm not going to rehash Luke's uh, investigation report to you. Um, the department just would recommend that you pay the claim in the amount of um, $100,288.89. Mr. President, I would make the motion that we approve the department's partial payment recommendation for damage claim 22125 as our current regulations define. It's been moved by uh, Commissioner Doobie. Is there any second? I'll second. Uh, it's been seconded by Commissioner Brokaw. Um, all those in favor? Discussion? Oh, discussion, sorry. Um, but I'm, I'm also not opposed to us reevaluating and looking at our methodology and our, our multipliers. Anything we would do above what we current regulations on would just be arbitrary. And I think we'd have a hard time defending that. So I speak for the motion. Mr. President, I would also add, I think we need to investigate multiplier. I think we need to investigate get our little form verified kills when we have a landowner with a good relationship with uh, department personnel and they're both trying hard i think there needs, there needs to be some flexibility there given to our our field people um so i i would like us to, to look into some options there bring us some recommendations for for simplifying that process Like discuss anything? Okay, um, it's been moved and seconded, and uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? It's been the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Kennedy. 
Mr. President, members of the commission, Director Nesbitt, good morning. I uh, wanted to give you a quick update on the Jackson Employee Housing Project. We, uh, we continue to move full steam ahead on this project. Uh, the engineer and hydrologist marked the site for the well uh, this week. Their driller will be out next week. So look for updates on water, hopefully good updates on water. Uh, I told you a couple of months ago that we weren't going to wait uh, for the results of the water to move forward on a lot of documentation and work to get this thing ready. So when we do get water, uh, we're ready to go with getting uh, people out on the ground to start this project. So we did, in fact, get our request for proposals out uh, for the design process. Uh, those proposals are due in mid-May, so we should have an update for you, uh, certainly by the time we have a retreat and uh, the, any proposal approved by the department will come back to the commission for final approval. As you know, you've allocated monies for this project, but you haven't give, given us authorization to spend that money. So we'll come back to you every time we have a step like putting out the, um, making a selection on the design process, uh, those types of big decisions, those will all come back to the full commission for approval. So you'll see that. Uh, later, hopefully in July for the design process. Uh, the next step is going to be, we've decided to, um, we decided to try to go with the construction manager at risk for this project. So there's a couple of ways we can approach this. Um, we can, of course, uh, design, bid, build, or we can uh, obtain what's called a construction manager at risk, which essentially is somebody that's watching this project from start to finish. Um, we don't have the capacity, as we're finding out with the Cody project, we don't have the capacity. Our engineering program is overwhelmed right now. Um, we don't have the capacity to watch every step of these projects, so we're missing some things. I mean, we, we work very hard to not miss them, but we do. So <clears throat> we chose to do this. The commission chose to, to go with the construction manager at risk for the conservation camp project. Um, we also went with the construction manager at risk quite some time ago for the Jackson regional office. And what we found through, um, certainly with a project like the conservation camp, what we found and what we're learning with the Cody project is that the construction manager at risk process um, can for sure uh, address all the workload issues in the department, save a lot of time and money on behalf of the department and also save us money in the long run uh, for efficiencies. And this construction manager at risk would work with the department team, would work with the design team from start to finish. They would have the responsibility to go out to bid, not the department, which is another huge benefit. So we don't have to go through our state process for selecting subcontractors and construction folks. They can do it um, and through their own process, which is quite, uh, more streamlined than ours. And so we think over time that through this project, this uh, will pay for itself in having the construction manager at risk. And we're looking at right now, very preliminary numbers. Again, these will come back to you for approval, but for the design, pro design cost, total design cost for this project, we're estimating to be about $700,000 right now consistent with what we talked to you about two, three years ago, uh, you set aside 9.7 million for this project. I'm not saying that we're gonna be able to pull it off because a lot has changed in the last two years uh, on these types of projects, but we did factor in this design cost uh, a couple of years ago. Construction manager at risk could be 900,000, a million dollars perhaps for a construction manager at risk. And again, a lot of these responsibilities of the construction manager at risk, for example, with Cody, are entailed into the contract with BHI. Those would not be in the contract uh, that we would have for the design process for this project, because it would be the responsibility of a construction manager at risk. So those costs for the construction manager at risk would have occurred, most of those costs, through other avenues, in particular, with who we select for the design would have those responsibilities. But Again, we're finding that um, that one entity cannot do a good job on these huge, complicated construction projects. So that's why we're proposing to do that. Again, both of those will come back to the commission for approval. 
hopefully one or perhaps both in July. Uh, we'll have an update for you at the, the retreat in June and off we go. So look for a lot of emails from me again, um, starting hopefully starting next week um, with good reports on water, I hope. With that, I'd stand for any questions. Mr. President, Mr. Kennedy, um, lots riding on this well, right? Lots. I mean, if we don't get water, sufficient water, we may have to reevaluate the whole thing. We right? might. Yep. They've spent uh, about a month, you know, before the winter, after the, fail, the failed last well, they spent a quite a bit of time. Then there was a lag through the winter months. And then in the last month, they've spent a lot of time. We're, we're as you recall, we're working with Jorgensen Engineering in Jackson. They've been out on site with the hydrologists um, and... I've express, expressed my optimism on this before, um, but Jorgensen Engineering is pretty, pretty excited about this. They we, think. Need a, we need an old fashioned witcher out there. They actually did. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of riding on it. So look for, uh, let's hope for some positive updates from me uh, to all of you next week. Thank you. Thanks for your support for this project. It's important. Thanks, John. Thank you. And number eight, Cody Regional Office Project. Good morning, President Roberts, Director Nesvik, members of the commission, Eric Boltanger, Services Chief. Give you a brief update. We, it seems like yesterday, but maybe two or three weeks ago, we went through this and kind of had an update, but can update you on a few things as far as the construction phase. Things are moving right along. Siding is being installed. We're painting interiors. So things are looking good. Lauren was just up there yesterday for a meeting. Um, we did discuss at the last commission meeting our FF and E, the furniture. Um, we went out to bid for that with your permission. We got those bids in. We've organized everything. I can't give you an exact number, but we're way below. Well, I wouldn't say way below. We're below what we approved last commission meeting. So that's a good thing. And uh, that contract is being routed right now. So we're happy about that. There will be some logistical things with the furniture. I think we talked last time you know, the timing of it and will we actually get the furniture on time. Right now, we believe we'll get it sometime delivered in July. Um, of course, if you recall, we talked about the electrical panel delay, which the elevator is part of that. Um, we need the electric to move the elevator. So we can't move a lot of furniture up and down. We didn't want to go through the expense with the uh, moving company to have them actually carry stuff up the stairs. So I think we can get most of the furniture in the offices, but the metal shelving, which is pretty heavy, for the second floor in the uh, storage area. We're gonna have that stored in the uh, cold storage area until we get that um, elevator up and running. Once we have that done, then we'll probably sometime, hopefully in August, get the uh, metal framing and the storage stuff up in the second floor. And we're still shooting for sometime in August. Um, the last change order we got for time extension was September 15th from them. And we pushed back like we uh, talked about at the last commission meeting for September 1st. and uh, they have went ahead and agreed to that change order for September 1st. And that's what we're rolling for. So we hopefully we'll be done before then. They believe pending any further delays or future delays, I guess, that uh, we should be able to move in sometime in August. That's my hope. That's your update for your Cody Regional Office. And I stand for any questions if you have any. Sounds good. How did the uh, paint situation end up? Are we missing payment or pavement or? <laughs> President Roberts, Commissioner Labick. Um, I think as far as I'm concerned, it's a, we're moving past it. Um, there's been talks. They're not happy with the decision, but I think their job as a general contractor is to figure that out with their subcontractor. It's not on the Game of Fish to fix that problem. Thank you. I'd like to thank you and your folks. Thanks. Yeah, and a rough one. That's a beautiful facility. <laughs> they well served with that facility. It's going to be a nice one. And I really like the ASI station on the side too. And the bare room. But anyway, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Good morning, Mr. President, Commissioners, Director Nesvik, um, Meredith Wood, Chief Financial Officer 
agenda item number nine, which is request approval for additional dollars to the commission's FY22 current budget um, for three categories and a total amount of $1,150,000. The three categories are um, vehicles, damage claims, and postage. Uh, for vehicles, we have 36 passenger vehicles that were approved by the commission for replacement in the FY22 budget. Those were recently put out to bid and the total over original approved budget is $450,000, which is about 12,000 more per vehicle than we originally anticipated. The damage budget um, originally had 1,155,000 approved in it we're requesting an additional 600,000 there's 145 claims to date of those 23 are pending payment um, and there's still a couple months left in the fiscal year so we're anticipating a few others will probably trickle in uh, for that category and then finally postage we've had a couple of changes to our outdoor antelope regulations fur bear regulations converting from different sizes and so forth um, which has increased cost for postage. We also have all of the in remaining in FY22, all the big game non-resident elk and June draw licenses to be distributed. And the price of postage has gone up. So we're requesting a hundred thousand for that category. So pending any questions, I'd like to request approval from the commission to increase your FY22 budget by $1,150,000 as presented. What was that again? 1,150,000. So moved. So second. So it's moved by Commissioner Doobie, seconded by Sec Commissioner Brokaw to uh, increase the budget $1,150,000. All those, oh, discussion? Question on the <laughs> vehicles. We were having troubles getting them in. Is that is that still the same? Uh, Mr. Good. President, Commissioner Brokaw, yes. And even with that bid that we received um, that ranges from about 240 to 500 days delivery. That's crazy. Oh. Any more questions? Okay, I call for a vote. All those in favor, signal aye. 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 All those opposed, uh, motion carries. We'll increase it. Thanks. Okay, um, moving on to agenda item 10, if that's okay with you, Mr. President. For a request for the commission to approve 6% transfer out of your lifetime license fund to the Game and Fish Operating Fund. As defined under Wyoming Statute 231501C, which is the lifetime license fund, on an annual basis, the commission has the authority to um, approve this particular transfer. For FY22, I anticipate that total amount, the 6% being just over $410,000 um, with an estimated balance in that account of 6.8 million. So pending any questions, um, I'd like to ask the approval of the commission to transfer up to that 6%, roughly $411,000 at the end of May. FY22 prior to the end of the fiscal year. Move to approve. Second. It has been moved by Commissioner Ladway to uh, second by Commissioner Berg for the transfer of 6% lifetime to the general fund. And then um, any discussion? Is, is Mr. President, correct? it's that transfer from the lifetime license fund to your commission operating fund. Operating fund, general operating fund. Yes. Yeah. Any discussion? Okay, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor, signal aye. 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 All those opposed, or nay. The ayes have it. Uh, it's been approved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's just 
Commission President, members of the commission, Director Nesvik, I'm here to present item number 11, approval of licensed selling agents. Currently, um, I'm standing before you to ask approval to for one new licensed selling agent, Bellwood Boats in Glenwood, and the transfer of ownership of two licensed selling agents, KB Hardware and Lumber in Lovell, and Top of the World Store in Cody. Currently in Glendo, we have three other licensed selling agents. And so Elwood Boats would be the fourth licensed selling agent. That agent was approved by the local game warden and regional wildlife supervisor to support that um, licensed selling agent. And then the two non-sporting good transfer of ownership, KB Hardware, formerly the Lovell Building Center in Lovell. There's one other licensed selling agent in Lovell. And so that received a, um, support for transfer. And the third one is Top of the World Store in um, Cody. They are actually on the Beartooth Pass. And um, this one is supported as well. There are seven other agents in Cody, but this is a remote location. And this agent has also agreed to go on our electronic licensing system. So they are the last agent that the department had that was on manual offline license books. And so in previous years, we had entered approximately 600 offline license documents manually in the license section. So this is um, very encouraging that they now have internet access and will be able to sell those through our license selling system. And so at this time, I would stand for any questions. Questions? On the one that you were, uh, Mr. President, Mm -hmm. On the one that you were just talking about, the one up, uh, Cody and up in the Beartooth, uh, it says in the report, their application, that the, the uh, check will be remitted from the corporate home office to Game and Fish directly without a report. So when they sign up, they will send that agent that check in. Um, to sign up for that. And so that was just notes in their paperwork um, to sign up as an agent. And so we'll get that. And then we will, we have been requesting every transfer or new owner when we bring them to training to sign up for the electronic payment processing system. And right now we are just under 56% of our licensed selling agents on that electronic payment transfer. Okay, thank you. So what I'll be asking for, if somebody wants to move on um, to approve one new licensed selling agent, Bellwood Boats, uh, Glendo, and a transfer of ownership for KB Hardware and Lumber, the former Lovell Building Center, Lovell and Top of the World store in Cody. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Uh, Commissioner Bird has made the motion. Do I have a second? Uh, Commissioner Ladd, will the second motion uh, discussion? With no discussion, uh, I'll call for a vote. All those that it would approve the transfer, say aye. 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 All those opposed, with nay, uh, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. At um, this time, I want to rep Representative Winters, thank for coming today. We appreciate you coming to listen and uh, hope everything's going well. That's good. Thumbs up means good, right? <laughs> With the legislators, thumbs up always means good, kind of. <laughs> but thank you. Okay. Oh, good stuff. This will be item number 12 for those that are following on that. Good morning, Mr. President, members of the commission, director. Uh, <clears throat> going to give a, an overview this morning on how we uh, import fish, our warm water uh, and cool water fish for stocking in the state, and talk a little about the, the invasive species risks that go with that. Eric, before you start, I just want to give the commission a little bit of a, a prelude here. So you know, we've, we've looked hard at this aquatic invasive species issue and how we continue to protect what we have, which is, as we know today, um, an, an aquagua and zebra mussel free state. And um, you guys are well aware of a lot of the efforts we've taken to this point with 
with looking at boats when they come into the state, a lot of public education, quick responses when we have had a potential threat like the, the moss ball issue. Um, we've done a, a lot of work with developing rapid response plans. The, this is something that, that I've asked the, the fish division to look into now for a couple of years to really look at what the potentials are to raise our own warm and cool water fish in the state. Because as I think you know, we, we import them from, this is another potential vector. Um, and we import a lot of them. I mean, our, most of our, all of our walleye until we started this project came from out of state. And, and obviously walleyes are really important sport fish in Wyoming. And so anyway, Dirk um, and the team have done a really good job of looking at this. There's still work to be done as you'll see when Dirk presents this, but uh, um, that's kind of the, a little bit of the background here. Thanks, Dirk. Thank you, Director Nesbeck. So anyway, our hatcheries in this state do a great job raising trout and salmon. Um, we have traditionally imported the warm and cool water fish and have not raised any of our uh, warm or cool water fish. Warm walleye fishing, some of the warm and cool water species that we import are very popular with the public. Uh, we have a segment of the angling public that really appreciates uh, those opportunities. Um, we, we don't stock them everywhere in the state. Not all the waters are conducive to supporting uh, uh, warmer, cool water fisheries. Um, but there are many really popular fisheries throughout the state that rely on, on these imported fish. Oh, there we go, little lag. Not to push too many buttons. Okay, so last year, here's the fish that we imported from, from out of state. So we got walleye, channel catfish, sauger, tiger muskie, bluegill, black crappie, and black crappie bluegill hybrids. Uh, we, we were looking to get largemouth bass and northern pike, and those weren't, weren't available last year. Um, <laughs> see how I do with a, with a slow clicker. I have a bunch of, uh, a lot of maps that I want to show you. Um, this base map here shows the locations of the hatcheries around this country where we've obtained warmer, cool water fish since 2005. And I'll just say there's nothing magic about 2005 other than that's when I, I could get that data. So this is, these are the places we've come, uh, got fish since then. And what I'll do here is, there we go. So just kind of highlight, here's where those fish came from. So I'm going to go through several of these. So here's where we got uh, black and uh, white crappie. Uh, all those are in Arkansas. Blue grill, uh, bluegill and green sunfish bluegill hybrids came from Oklahoma. Uh, we got channel catfish from a lot of places over time and channel catfish have been harder to get. So some of the dots on this map you'll see later as places we can't get fish from any longer just because they, they don't have uh, extra fish to provide us. Largemouth bass uh, from Colorado, and then the two hatcheries, the two federal hatcheries on this map are in North Dakota. Talk more about them later. Sauger uh, from one facility in Nebraska, and then also from Colorado. Tiger muskie um, in Nebraska, and then we, we did get them before from Pennsylvania. And then walleye and northern pike have come from Garrison Federal Fish Hatchery in uh, North Dakota. And then here's several of the places that we don't get fish from for a variety of reasons, um, uh, including invasive species, fish availability, or in the case of Pennsylvania, it's just a really long ways to go to get fish. And we're, we got tiger muskie there, and now we're able to get them closer to home. So I'm gonna show you uh, 10 or 12 maps that look like this. And so this is the distribution of, of, in this case, Northern snakehead, which are an invasive fish that we don't want. But you'll just see the brown on the map is where those critters are. And then um, here's the stars are where those hatcheries that I showed you a second ago are. So just kind of show you where there's bad stuff and, and where, uh, where we're getting fish from. 
it's a really annoying lag on the clicker. Um, so there's uh, big head carp and black carp and silver carp, all carp species we don't want. Rusty crayfish. Asian clams. And then a few plant species here, curly pondweed. Eurasian water milfoil. And the last plant is hydrilla. And again, take home message from all those maps is there's, there's brown over lots of places where we're getting fish. So change gears on the, the map layout. This is a map of the zebra and quagga mussel distribution in the country. And there's the stars for the hatcheries. Um, and you'll see uh, in the case in one of those in North Dakota, a star right on top of one of the hatcheries there. We zoom in a little bit. Um, two places to call out attention to. I'll talk more about Garrison uh, National Fish Hatchery, which is where we're getting walleye and northern pike. And then that red dot is the Valley City National Fish Hatchery, which in 2021, they discovered zebra mussel villagers in their water supply and in some of the ponds. Um, so that shut them down for uh, their fish production. And the net effect on us is it reduced by about 20% the number of walleye that we can get from Garrison and it will into the foreseeable future due to the production of the needs of the state of North Dakota. This year with the, and, and you heard from Guy Campbell um, at a previous meeting about the walleye trials at Spies. This year we will make up a portion of that shortcoming with another round of the walleye trials. Um, and, and we get walleye and Northern Pike from Garrison, but Garrison is definitely at risk. So a, another map, so the Missouri River system, and there are six main stem dams on the Missouri um, that, There's another look of, of that, a zoomed in area and you can see the Missouri River going up there um, and you can see where mussels are so far. One thing to point out is two places upstream in the upper end of the Missouri and Montana are places where zebra mussel villagers were detected, but a population did not establish. So there, but zebra mussels have been up there. It's the significant risk still. And so go back to this um, Missouri River map and the, the three lower, the three lowest uh, lakes or reservoirs on the system are currently positive for, uh, they're infested with, with zebra mussels. So there's Lake Oahe upstream, and then there's a direct connection to uh, Garrison Federal Hatchery. And there's a photo of Garrison's, the hatchery, you can see the ponds. This is the river in the bottom of the photo. You can see the dam there and, and uh, Oahe or uh, Sakakawea upstream. And so that, that facility is at significant risk with these open water. Um, they're, they're not raising these fish in a building. They're not raising them on, on uh, well water. These are um, open ponds that when, when zebra and quagga mussels, when zebra mussels get up there, we will no longer be able to get walleye from, from Garrison. So increasing risks, um, many of the places that we've gotten fish from are no longer available to us. We work hard with the, the people we get fish from to try to um, reduce the, the risk of importations. 
Um, and certainly our main source for walleye is, is in jeopardy. We're working to be careful about the fish we bring in. Um, we try to get them off of well or closed water supplies. Um, we're, we're working with, you know, those people are giving you fish and you can't just say, well, I want to ask you to do a bunch of extra work when you load those fish, but we ask them anyway. And, and they're careful. We're trying to be more careful when we load them. And then once we get them here now, we're inspecting all of those loads um, before we stock them. So a couple pictures here. Um, this is what we call walleye boarding. So those fish come onto the board there, run down and then come out the bottom. So that's look one same operation from above and, and below, but run those fish through there, take a look at all of them, pull out any frogs or snails or whatever else you see that shouldn't be, you know, pass the fish through and, and try uh, not to put anything else there. And as we do those inspections, we're, you know, pretty careful, but we're still finding hitchhikers. So here's a, a, a crayfish from part of the country that's a crayfish we don't have here and we don't want here. Um, there's a container full of bullfrogs that came in a load as well. So even when we're careful loading them, we're inspecting them. But that's a labor intensive process and it's hard on the fish. The, the, those walleye survival is certainly impacted or the, all the fish that we run across there is in, maybe not the catfish, they're pretty tough, but most of the rest of them are, are impacted by that. Another thing, so all the stuff I showed you up till now has to do with invasive species, um, plants and, and animals that we don't want. Um, there's some disease issues, a uh, particular VHS virus that, that has um, limited many of the places that we could possibly get warm and cool water fish. We just don't wanna risk getting VHS in Wyoming from that, um, it's, a, it's a risk in some of our partners, we just can't trade with any longer. And then another thing that's noteworthy, when you look at those maps, a lot of the, the cold water, um, potential cold water partners, Montana, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, California, there are places that we could trade um, and get fish from and we don't there for other disease concerns as well. So in the end, our conclusion is it's safest to raise our own fish. We think it's gonna uh, at least minimize our AIS concerns. Uh, we won't need to do any more boarding or inspecting because we're raising those fish and loading them out of our um, intensive culture facilities. It'll be safer for, for our employees. We send people on pretty long road trips. Um, they stay up all night to try to keep fish alive. Um, and we think it's gonna improve the survival and, and growth of those fish once we get them here. Um, at the point now where we've had them on the truck for a couple of days and we, we get them in the water as soon as we can, we know that there are better times a day to minimize predation, to stock them. We'd be able to do that. Um, we may be able to manipulate the size some and, and get them at a better size or stock them at a, in a water at a time that we control. Now, if our partners say it's time to come get walleye, then it's time to come get walleye. And so perhaps we could better time the, the plankton blooms or the productivity of waters when we, when we stock them. Um, and they'll just spend less time in the truck, which is good. So you heard from Guy about the walleye trials. Um, we successfully have reared a, a walleye at Spees. We picked walleye because they're harder. So we think that many of those other species, if we, can, if we could do walleye, we could do the others we believe um, and right now we're going to offset some of those cuts in from North Dakota, but in the long run, um, we could eliminate the need to go out of state. So we looked, can we raise these fish ourselves? So one of the things we evaluated several years ago was if, what if we just bought another place? Could we find a place that had the water and had enough property to, to do it? And we, that turned out to, you know, our estimates were 30, $35 million to do something like that. So we thought, well, could we do it at one of our existing facilities? It would be more efficient from a, a staffing and personnel perspective, and um, perhaps it would be less expensive. So we've looked at SPEES. We have the water there. Um, some of the infrastructure is in place in terms of the pipes and the 
the whole system that we could tie into that that could reduce our costs. We've developed preliminary plans internally. Um, Guy Campbell, the head of the fish culture section, and the uh, other team of employees that he put together kind of looked pretty hard at how would we do it, what would we do, and came up with a preliminary scheme, a drawing of what a hatchery would look like and um, what, a, what we would do in a building and how we would set it up. Uh, and, and we concluded that we should probably um, get some expert opinion on that. And so we've, we're, we've hired a consulting firm to review the plans that our folks developed. Um, they're gonna do a, a bio programming. So essentially, can we raise as many fish as we hope to in, the, in those size of tanks with the temperature of water and the, the equipment that we would need to do all that? Um, and then also kind of just evaluate the infrastructure and plumbing and size of the building and, and what, what sort of confirm our thoughts on this would be the right way. This is a, a reasonable approach or recommend to us some alternatives. And that um, we've, we've got somebody working on that now. We expect to hear back from them later this summer. And, and uh, we're gonna come and report back to the commission on how that, what we, the findings of that report and uh, let you know uh, what we've what we've heard and perhaps have some recommendations. So today's just an informational presentation to kind of let you know what we're up to and what we're worried about and uh, happy to answer any questions for you. I've got a couple questions. I got two in particular words. Have we looked at any smallmouth bass? Um, no, smallmouth aren't on our list. Um, we, I think we can transplant them if we wish, and the we've not um, we have not wanted to put smallmouth in more places. We haven't needed to. We we don't want to stock those regularly. And another thing, and on, and I don't know about. I really believe that this state needs another hatchery. Um, I've all the hatcheries that I visit; these folks are cranking out all the fish as much as they can. Uh, I see the commission owns land everywhere. There's got to be some sort of a pre-existing land that we own that has water that can make these functions that we're looking at. Um, I truly believe that if we've uh, we could sustain another hatchery. We could make it state of the art hatchery. We could put all these fears to 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 bed on all of this. And, and cost wise, nothing's getting cheaper. And uh, and eventually, I can't see any. We're going to have to have a new hatchery somewhere anyway, uh, in my opinion. But um, uh, and and I know that the and this one thing I'm finding out with hatcheries, fisheries are very frugal, very, very frugal with how they do everything. And they, they work their butts off to, to whether they're fixing things or cleaning things or everything. It's a, it's a very, it's, it's a very uh, cost effective uh, agency, I think, or cost effective um, part of our uh, uh, agency. But I, I can't see that. Uh, I mean, I would like to see explore uh, why try to retrofit anything when we can go in and, and, and build something that was new, that was laid out and go from there? Mr. President, we think it will be more cost effective to build where we are for at, if we move forward at SPEES, the staffing. So the staffing need, if you were to have a warm and cool water facility, the, the window of intensive work is relatively short. You spawn them, hatch them, stock them out. You don't raise catchable. We, I don't think we would raise catchable size fish like we might do um, walleye eat each other. You'd have one big walleye when you were done. And so the, that, that window of staffing need is shorter. So we felt like building a new place would be, you'd have to fully staff that and you would be less efficient with those people when it was less busy. Um, what about all the other species besides walleye? 
I mean, really, we're not we're not looking at anything. You know, my understanding is just walleye is really the one that's the species working on, which they're doing a wonderful job at. What about the other, the crappie and the, and the catfish and that aspect? We could do them in the same. That's what this program and this evaluation we're doing now is could we raise, rear what we need in, in a single facility to handle all of the, the, our needs? So we, we would do it at a single place. Um, and, and if we were to, you know, to your point, um, appreciate the, and, and I share your opinion on the good and hard work that our folks in the fish hatcheries do. Um, if we were going to expand our ability to raise trout and salmon, what we saw when in the, the phase we went through when, when whirling disease impacted several of our hatcheries and we went in and modernized them and increased the efficiency. So for example, at Spees, we went from, I think, 60,000 pounds of trout a year to some, you know, 200, over 200,000 pounds of trout a year. Um, there are some facilities where we have water. We, we talked a little, we talked about Tillet. Um, it, it hasn't been modernized. There's a good water supply there. There's places that we would probably go. Boulder is another spot where there's some water and we have old linear raceways. So I, I think from an efficiency perspective, if we could find a place on, on one of our uh, commission owned lands that had water um, in sufficient quantity and quality to, to, rear, to run a hatchery, we'd sure look at it. But right now the best water supplies we have are at the places where we've got hatcheries. And so I think we would, would continue to modernize at those facilities in an effort if we were looking to increase production. Mr. President, um, so Spees is really the only warm water capability that we have at this time. When we looked around, it seemed like the best fit um, because of the the facility. The there's a spot we could do it. We have water. I mean, Spees raises so many fish now because of the available water, and so that was the the best location we felt from a sort of the biology, the logistics of the arrangement of the facility itself and, and what our other options would be. So if, if, if it was to be expanded and you start putting more species in there, are we going to run into a problem with having all our eggs in one basket? Mr. President, um, Commissioner Ladwig, I, the way we would set that facility up, it would be isolated. The water would come in there and leave and not touch any of the other fish. So if we ever had a problem in one of the buildings with trout, it wouldn't affect the warmer cool water and similarly. And the, a lot of the bioprogramming evaluation in terms of how we would set up a warm and cool water facility has to do with how you run the plumbing and how you use the water. We would recirculate water, um, reuse the, the water that we have in the building and we would have isolation uh, facilities, separate isolation so you could bring fish in from the outside and not jeopardize the, the fish that you had in. Um, so I hope not. Thank you. I would, I, I would still highly encourage the uh, everybody to look at maybe a new site for for a hatchery and just put that in the mix with the with the expanding the other ones. I don't know what kind of a popular idea that is with the department, but um, uh, I can just see that the need's going to be it's not going to get any less. It's going to become more. We're getting more of a populated state. I just kind of like to see if we could somehow get out in front of it. Uh, and, and I don't know anymore. They tell you, you know, when they take old buildings or whatever, they say, oh, it's just cheaper to knock it down and do a new one. And so I don't know whether that same, that, that same rides over to a hatchery or whatever, and, and it's got to be manned. And I understand all of that. But, um, you know, we spend a lot of money in the commission on different 
facilities and regional things. And, and I just don't want to see the hatcheries left out. I think that a lot of there's antiquated stuff that they're doing. And uh, I don't think it would hurt for us to explore an option for a new hatchery in this state that specifies warm water and, and that. So that's just my thoughts. Um, I don't know. I would encourage the department to look in that also and maybe report that back when we get the other information on the um, uh, with the consultant. Yeah, Mr. President, we'll we'll give that some thought. I don't I can't I don't know enough of the details about what Dirk has done to this point and the team has done at this point at looking at existing facilities as well as a potential new one, but we should be able to provide um a little bit more information about kind of what that analysis looked like, what it could look like for a new a new hatchery when we um, get together, either at the next uh, commission meeting or at the retreat. And this report that that Dirk's going to bring back, I think, is September, right? We Ish? should have it. We we should have it at the September meeting. If we don't, we will at November for sure. Yeah, and we we haven't to this point in this investigation process and at Spees, we haven't like gone over the threshold of we we spent so much money now we're fully committed we wouldn't you know we're not intending to do that until the commission is completely on board at the beginning um we just want to have enough information to be able to say yes or no we think this is a good or a bad idea and, and before we actually kind of say yeah we're we're heading out with this idea thank you thank you thank you thank you thanks Dirk. Um, I think uh, be a good time to have a break now. So let's break for 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll resume with uh, uh, item number 13. Right. Commissioners, don't forget to turn off your mics. Okay, we're, we're going to go ahead and do uh, item number 13. And uh, you'll explain. Right. Mr. President, um, Director Nesvik, members of the commission, thanks. Uh, appreciate uh, coming back up to the podium. Um, this time it's not for hunting seasons or any kind of changes, but uh, we have uh, Dr. Hall Sawyer is presenting on potential impacts of uh, utility scale solar developments. And uh, Dr. Sawyer has an incredibly long history with um, our a lot of our biologists and, and coordinators in, in Wyoming. And he's worked uh, with us since 1990s, uh, focusing on animal movements. Um, he's often working behind the scenes on migrations, impacts of energy development, and a lot of long-term studies that we're involved with as well. Um, you may be familiar with him. He's uh, one of our choice collaborators when we have uh, projects, whether it's uh, Carter Mountain Pronghorn, uh, you know, or uh, working on uh, mule deer collaring in different parts of the state from uh, the Red Desert to Hoback or uh, you know, migrations in the, in the and seasonal movements in Sheridan. Um, so he's often called upon by our guys to uh, one of the first guys they call to try and work with. And um, he'll be presenting here for the next half an hour on, on uh, solar energy. So I'll turn it over to Hall. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Uh, I'll assume that my audio is okay. If not, uh, somebody please interrupt and uh, I'll go ahead and try to share my screen here. All right, I can't see the meeting now, but I assume my screen is shared. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you all carving out some time for me uh, today. I just wanted to take a few minutes and talk about an emerging issue that's quickly becoming more important for big game management. And that is the trade-offs that we face with utility scale solar development on our rangelands and our ability to continue to provide ungulates with adequate habitat. Before I get started, I want to point out that this is the first study ever published on solar development in big game. And the Game and Fish Department deserves a lot of credit for this, especially given that at the time, uh, Wyoming only had one utility scale solar project in the entire state. And yet other Western states have dozens and dozens, but it's Wyoming that is leading uh, the way on this topic. So. Kudos to the Game and Fish Department uh, for being a leader uh, on this topic. And see if I can advance a slide here. 
There we go. All right, well, to begin with, solar has become an efficient and cost-effective means to achieve renewable energy standards in the U.S. and more broadly reduce global carbon emissions. And sometimes it's, it's not all that obvious uh, living in Wyoming, but solar is on the rise and in a serious way. Our neighboring states are deploying tens of thousands of acres of solar development a year. And a recent report from the Department of Energy predicts that solar will grow from 3% of US electric supply today up to 40% by 2035. So this type of development is really on the rise and coming at us. And with this rapid and widespread deployment of solar energy uh, comes a new set of challenges uh, for wildlife and wildlife habitat. But the potential impacts of solar development aren't just from the PV panels uh, that you see here. Rather, they also come from the security fencing that's required to be built around the perimeter of these projects. So you can imagine in contrast to some of the smaller bodied uh, uh, mammals, uh, that can move through fence like this. Larger body mammals like our mule deer and elk and pronghorn uh, can't move through these types of fences at all. And so when we site these projects in big game habitat, uh, we effectively remove uh, that big game habitat. It's no longer available to them. And if they avoid any of this infrastructure, uh, that can create in other indirect habitat losses. And Depending on the size and configuration of these projects, uh, they can block animal movements and reduce landscape connectivity. And as you might imagine, uh, resonant and migratory segments can be affected uh, differentially uh, by these potential impacts. So with the help of agencies and industry, uh, we attempted to evaluate these impacts at the first uh, utility scale solar site ever constructed in Wyoming. And that was the Sweetwater uh, facility that was built in 2018, just north of Green River along Highway 72. This, of course, is an area known to be important to pronghorn. So just a quick slide on our methods with direct habitat loss with solar development is really pretty easy. All we have to do is calculate uh, the amount of habitat that's removed from the security fence. Indirect habitat loss, though, is a little more complicated. We need GPS collars, and uh, with our GPS collars, we calculate the amount of time that animals spent near the project before and after the construction to see if there's any difference. And then for these barrier effects, uh, we again use GPS data and simply calculated the proportion of animals that move through the project area before construction, knowing that after construction, uh, those animals would have to figure out a way to move around or modify their uh, movements uh, to accommodate uh, for that security fence. All right, well, a quick study timeline here. Uh, in March of 2018, we captured 20 pronghorn. We equipped them with GPS collars that collected locations at every two hours. In October of that same year, the security fencing uh, was constructed. So that gave us uh, about six months of pre-construction data collection. November, we caught a, a few more pronghorn. And then about a year later was the infamous Highway 372 incident, which uh, I suspect most of you recall from the papers, and I can talk about that incident uh, a little bit later. And then in November of 2020, the collars dropped off. So that effectively gave us six months of pre-construction data and about two years of post-construction data. And all in all, we ended up with about 200,000 locations collected from 23 animals. 70% of those animals were resident and 30% were migratory. With that in mind, let's uh, 
take a look at some of the results. Uh, what we're looking at here are our resident animals. These are the GPS locations uh, pre-construction. You can see there was a lot of uh, locations uh, within that uh, project site. And then if we skip over to post-construction GPS, these are the same animals after construction. You can see that that habitat's just effectively removed. And this particular project was about 550 acres of habitat that uh, is gone. When we think about indirect habitat loss, the way we, we did that is we took the same points that you're looking at here and basically created polygons that show where most of the points were or where animals spent most of their time. So when we convert all these points to polygons that represent high use areas, you can see on the left and in the purple that this project was sited pretty much in the middle of what we define as high use pronghorn habitat. If we go over on the right in the orange, the post-construction, you can see that we had a drop off or decrease in high use uh, habitat within one and two kilometers of the project area, especially on the Northwest and that those Southeast sides. This was actually a really surprising result because there's not a lot of human activity or disturbance associated with solar facilities uh, compared to say some of our oil and gas fields. Uh, nonetheless though, these results do indicate that we need to keep this idea of avoidance and indirect habitat loss in mind uh, as we get more solar development on our rangelands. When we move on to barrier effects, the resident segment of the population that we just looked at, uh, basically 70% of those animals utilize that project area before development. And so essentially 70% of them had to uh, modify their daily and seasonal movements to accommodate that uh, facility. When we look at the migratory segment that we're looking at here on the map, we found that 86% of these migrants uh, move through the project area before development. Now what these migration maps always highlight are that of course, impacts from development like this aren't just localized, but rather they can be far reaching. And in fact, we had one pronghorn here, you see there in kind of that orange color that moves 160 miles each year up to Green River uh, lakes. And so these, all of these animals on their spring and fall migrations now have to figure out ways to migrate around or cut their migration short uh, because of this facility. Now, these are just the animals that live year round around the Sweetwater area. And I think we all know that during hard winters, we can end up with hundreds, and thousands of pronghorn uh, stacked up along Interstate 80. And uh, that happens from those animals come from other populations that usually spend their time uh, in, in other areas. One of these herds is what we call the opal herd. And they usually spend their time uh, 20, 30 miles northwest of there uh, in that opal country and then summer in the south end of the Wyoming range. But in hard winters, they do migrate down toward the interstate. And, uh, the University of Wyoming happened to have collars out on these animals prior to construction of the solar facility. And we had one of those weather events and were able to document that 57% of these animals moved through the facility uh, on their way to escape winter conditions up, up, up north. And so uh, these barrier effects not only affected the resident and migratory animals that live in that country, but also these other populations that periodically have to migrate south to escape uh, tough conditions. And that periodic movement to escape tough winter conditions brings us to this uh, Highway 372 incident that happened in 2019, when we had uh, hundreds of pronghorn uh, moving south uh, parallel to Highway 372 
when for the first time they encountered this security fence on the north end. Some of those animals hit the fence and were funneled around the west side of the project area, but several other hundred, several hundred other animals hit that fence and were funneled to the east where they busted through the right-of-way fencing and got out onto the highway. We had multiple animals uh, hung up in fences that were killed or died. Um, we had hundreds of animals end up on the right-of-way in the highway, uh, running south down the highway uh, on, with icy roads. Um, game and fish personnel were out there trying to open right-of-way gates, get these animals off the highway. Um, and, and it was just, it was a messy situation. Um, but it certainly highlighted and brought to our attention what can happen when we block animal movements um, close in areas close to a highway where their movements can be funneled out on to a highway. So given this incident and results from our study, there's, there's a few obvious sort of management implications I think we need to keep in our minds moving forward. And the first is that siting for solar projects is, is really important. Uh, ideally, we can avoid siting these projects in areas that have important habitat to big game or provide important movement corridors. Uh, and ideally, too, solar projects are sited in areas that are, have been previously disturbed rather than our native rangelands that uh, are typically more valuable for wildlife. Now, given the amount of solar that is and is going to be deployed, it will not always be possible uh, to avoid big game habitat. And so when we do develop areas with big game habitat, we really need to figure out ways to minimize the footprint of these areas and allow for animal movement through or around these projects to maintain connectivity. And what this is typically means as these projects get larger or even the size of the Sweetwater is that we're gonna need to split these things up into two or three uh, different arrays with corridors in between so that animals can safely access animal or habitat on either side, or, or in the case of Sweetwater, not be pushed out onto the highway. Obviously, uh, having baseline movement and distribution data, like GPS movement data, uh, is key for effective siting and these layout designs. But another unique thing about solar is it is, can be built so fast that it can be difficult to collect pre-construction data. So I think it would be warranted in areas where there is high solar potential or we expect solar development to do preemptive GPS monitoring on big game species that we're concerned about. And that way, when these projects come through uh, at the development the proposal stage, uh, regulators and agencies have these data in hand to help with siting and help with uh, layout design. Now I should point out too that we don't know a whole lot or basically anything about what corridor widths we need to move pronghorn or deer or elk through these type of facilities. But we need that information so that we can develop best management practices that can be applied uh, not only in Wyoming, but uh, across the West. So in order to, to learn about this, we're, we're gonna have to take some chances and experiment with different corridor widths and sizes and. Uh, figure out what works and what doesn't. And uh, the Game and Fish and the BLM are, are leading an effort to do just that uh, back at the Sweetwater facility with a post hoc fence modification uh, intended to uh, avoid any future incidents on Highway 372. And the proposed plan is here, um, you can see that the current security fence basically replace the old right-of-way fence. But there remains about a 150 foot nice gap of rangeland between the fence and the solar panels. 
So what the proposal is, is to build another security fence over there to the left, up close to the solar panels, and then open the fence up to the north so that these animals have this 150 foot corridor that they can move along parallel to the highway, but not in the right of way. Um, my understanding is that the fundraising for this is just about complete uh, and that uh, it's possible this could happen as early as this fall, but it's probably something that will happen in 2023. But these are the types of uh, projects we need to keep experimenting with um, so that future solar uh, sites uh, are, are, are laid out correctly and we, we, we avoid these problems that we have at Sweetwater. And then the last just sort of idea I, I wanna leave you with that you, you will probably hear a lot of in the years to come is this idea that the broader benefits of solar or renewable energy, uh, benefits of achieving renewable energy standards or reducing global carbon uh, can outweigh the local or regional impacts those projects might cause to wildlife and wildlife habitat. But I think really what this study highlights is that we need to be really, really careful about where we site these projects, how we lay them out. Otherwise, these, these local and regional impacts to wildlife uh, really have the potential to accumulate uh, quickly. And with that, I can take any questions and uh, maybe I'll stop sharing my, my screen here. Dr. Sawyer, I'm, this is Commissioner Roberts. Um, along with, I know there's this big influx of solar coming, and um, uh, one of the other things is, it was told to me that it's, it's really the we're getting a capability of tons and tons of power out there. The, the problem arises on a lot of transmitting the transmission lines from the power. For are, are there going to be any? Do we need to be concerned about any increase of? of power line construction or anything that's gonna be associated with all of these solar, because uh, uh, it's my understanding that the power lines are full. They can't take any more power on the line. So my thought is just, are, are they gonna, are we gonna be, need to be concerned about the expansion of, of, of transmission? Well, well, you're right. And a lot of the, the reason that this 372 in the Southwest part of the state uh, has had multiple, there's been a lot of other proposals. They just haven't come to fruition, but that's because we see uh, uh, Jim Bridger and Kimmer areas, the transmissions in place, but those utilities are wanting to uh, replace those electrons from fossil fuels with renewable energy. And so the transmission's already in place in many of those areas. It's just the utilities are changing the type of electrons they want. And so. That's why the 372 area is a, a, a hot area for uh, solar because that transmission's in place. But there also is new transmission coming. Uh, you're probably aware of the Choke Cherry, Choke Cherry Sierra Madre wind project uh, near Rollins. It's gonna be the largest wind facility uh, in the US. Uh, that transmission line uh, just got approved uh, a few weeks ago and will be running from Wyoming to Nevada. And it's going to be the latest and greatest of transmission lines. So um, I think a little bit of both. You're going to see turnover from or more renewable energy uh, going on existing transmission and you're going to see new transmission uh, uh, building out the grid as well. And it's also a lot of it's going on private land. And as far as siding on, on private land, uh, that pretty much goes through the county commissioners, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think you're right. Um, and you're right about the private land. And, uh, in Colorado, uh, again, this is a, that's a state where they're literally deploying tens of thousands of acres of solar 
per year and almost all of that is on private lands. So um, the ability to uh, affect siting on private lands is pretty limited, but nonetheless, I think it's good to have on our radar because uh, uh, some of these areas I'm seeing in Colorado uh, are mostly ag lands but they're still important big game habitat. And so you get a thousand acres fenced off of what used to be weed or alfalfa or whatever, and now that's gone. And all those elk are going to the neighbor's place or, or wherever, and, and that's just multiplying all over. So it's not gonna be long before that catches up and creates some real, real headaches, so, um, but, I mean, yeah, Mr. President, I'm Commissioner Director Nesvik. If I could jump in here, Dr. Sawyer. Sure. Um, because of this project and the attention it got when you had all those pronghorn on the highway, it really helped push some legislation through a few years ago that now requires solar to go through the Industrial Siding Council state permitting process. So there is now a state permit for it as well as a county. Thank you. That cleared up a lot for me, Mr. President. Here. Angie, this is probably a question for you. What influence or um, power, so to speak, do we have over uh, siting location, siting construction? They mentioned possibly breaking the, the sites down to smaller sites so the wildlife can get through. How much influence do we have on that? Uh, Mr. President, uh, Commissioner Duby, I'd like to think a lot. <laughs> However, um, it kind of depends on the case. So this one was on Bureau of Land Management property. We worked very closely with the federal government on this one. However, there was no state permit process at the time. So as with all of our recommendations, they were just recommendations and um, we weren't successful here. We anticipated these problems and, and they came true. Um, for future ones, we are having a great deal of influence, um, both on private and on federal land. Uh, we really work with uh, industry folks early um, we've had a, several companies now come to us and propose, say, three or four sites and do like a preliminary review. So we try to direct them to the one with the least impact to fish and wildlife. Um, so in their industrial siding council permit, the proponent needs to um, explain and evaluate the potential impacts to fish and wildlife. And so they have the responsibility on them to do that. And then we are um, very vocal in our recommendations to both Industrial Siting Council and to the governor's office. Thank you. And a lot of the, with the migration work that you're doing, that'll go kind of hand in hand with this, won't it? Exactly. Yeah, Mr. President, like um, Dr. Sawyer said, that data that shows that coloring data where we can understand the game movement comes a lot into play. And so when a company comes to us and is proposing an area, the data that we currently have available, we can analyze and we can help gear or shape um, the solar, wind, whatever industrial um, development it is. So, yeah. Mr. President, a uh, question for Dr. Sawyer. Would you get more specific about the fencing retro rebuild? Uh, how much? How much is that estimated to cost? How much money do you have? There might left to be, raise. Yeah, again, I might. There might be somebody there at the department that has updated specifics. But my understanding was it was about a two hundred thousand dollar project, and. Uh, I'm not sure how much of that is left. Is there a department person that can help me out with that? Um, yeah, Mr. President, Commissioners, um, Dr. Sawyer, um, I don't have the exact figure at where we're at right now, but it's roughly $150,000 to $200,000 project. We first went and tried to really work with the BLM to put that expense back on the proponent or the company. Um, one thing with solar energy, similar to wind, is it changes hands many times. So the person who, the company that did the planning is often not the one who ends up owning or managing it. So they become sort of less invested over time because of that. Um, and there was nothing in the BLM's NEPA document, the um, EA, that uh, 
had an adaptive management approach that made them do this. So there was nothing BLM to do could do to go back and um, sort of enforce the proponent to make these changes. Um, with that said, we do know the impacts to the pronghorn. Dr. Sawyer explained that well. And so we're looking at ways to do that. Um, there's a lot of people interested. We have a lot of funding sources that we think we can come up with that. But I'm also worried about this precedent that it's setting. You know, I, I, I don't see the department coming in and maybe uh, paying for this because of the fact that we really want to put these on the companies and establish that sort of um, foundation that you, you need to apply adaptive management. Um, all of these comments, all of these fears came from our regional staff. They predicted this happening. They encouraged um, that change of the fence from day one, um, and it all came true. So um, again, we, we'd like to see that put back on the industry in the future. Thank you. I have no more questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, now we'll move to uh, number 14, Dan Thompson. President Roberts, members of the Commission, Director Nesvik. I never know if I'm going to get introduced or not, so that's why I was standing in the back. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Brian DeBolt and I will be giving kind of a year in the life of the large carnivore section for review. Uh, you already heard a lot about carnivores today, so I'm going to be talking about some of the work we've done the last year. Some of this will be a repeat, but I think repetition is good for some of these instances. Uh, you know, our, our job within our section and as a game and fish um, agency is to maintain viable populations of all wildlife, including large carnivores on the landscape. Uh, when you're dealing with a species like bears, lions, and wolves, there's, there's a different component as far as conflict resolution, human safety. And that's why we have uh, a very active conflict resolution program that Brian DeBolt will talk about. And I'll also talk about some of our outreach and education. I try to change this every year because all I have to do is Google craziness with carnivores and there's always a lot of funny things that you can come up with um you know i and i've said before I, i'll take interest over apathy any day uh there's a lot of opinions out there but we can use that to our advantage to to talk about these species um uh, and realizing the polarity that comes with them depending on which species you're talking about and again i think i think that's why we've this used to be a conflict update and we, we morphed it through the years because everything we do informs all of our actions. So the things we learn about through our research and monitoring informs how we deal with conflicts into the future. We just had a big discussion about potentially revising some of our chapter 28 regulations, which we're in the process of based on research that we recently completed in the Cody area. Um, and again, the education proactive work helps inform what we do. And it's very much a team approach within our section, within all the game and fish regions uh, and with multiple agencies as well. So for, for the species that we're talking about, mountain lions, black bears, grizzly bears, and wolves, um, it's primarily we evaluate trend for the populations. Uh, we, you just spent a very arduous day yesterday going through big game season setting. Well, in all, all game season setting. Uh, you know, I, I think it's important to, to accept and realize that we don't manage large carnivores like we do deer and elk because they're very different species and they have very different life histories. Obviously, wolves and grizzly bears are, are currently more involved just because of their recent or current status with federal protections. So I'm going to start with mountain lions. So mountain lions are the most cryptic cryptic of these species. Uh, you can't really just go out and count them. We've tried. Um, we've even tried aerial track census or surveys. Uh, there's, we, we keep trying, uh, but it's, it's not a matter of going out and counting them. 
And so we're continually evaluating the tools to be used in conjunction with harvest to better understand what's going on with these cats on the landscape. So we're evaluating harvest. Uh, this is the, the end of the current three-year cycle. And so uh, we'll be meeting with the regions in the next few weeks to talk about harvest limits. And we'll be in front of you in July to set our harvest. We do mountain lions and black bears on a three-year cycle. Um, uh, this is a kind of a heat map that Justin Clapp, our land biologist, put together. And it's, it's interesting to note this area in the Southeast Bighorns. It's basically a mortality per unit area of mountain lion habitat. Uh, we're keeping our eye on this. It's very interesting. Um, the, the goal is there is population reduction suppression from mountain lions. To our knowledge, that's the, the highest recorded density of uh, mortality of mountain lions ever in the world. Um, it'd be interesting to see through time what we can look at as far as changes in conflicts, changes in, in deer populations, things like that. All, all eyes are on deer right now. Um, and you know we're not seeing this subsequent uptick in deer, but it's something we're really keeping our eyes on. I'm going to go through a couple of the monitoring projects we've done throughout the state. Uh, we've been very active trying to, to increase our knowledge and provide our own managers and other managers with more information when it comes to mountain lions. And we started this in um, Rock Springs country. And uh, this, this uh, publication here is actually serving as, as it's being used throughout the world now to evaluate location data in a spatial way to evaluate predation. And it's a very, the, it's, it's amazingly, I call it the matrix. I'm, it's a joke because the, the, the computer modeling and the computation behind this is, is mind blowing. Um, but it, it allows people, it provides a, a modeling technique that provides this GPX, so a GPS, um, exchange format goes right to your device. You can go out to spots and look for, according to this, mountain lion made a kill here, or it's being used with wolves elsewhere. Um, it's a really cool tool for, for multiple managers to be using throughout the world right now. And again, what this, there's, everybody does these cluster techniques, they're called. Um, this was a way to try to bring them together, to have more consistent approach for managers and you know what's very interesting we're very in tune to predation right now and what we can do now is further quantify the notions of predation and for instance in southwest wyoming you know we can look at what are being taken off the landscape whether it's additive and compensatory this was part of the, the overall deer project that, that kevin monteith worked on uh, you know we found things that were interesting we see male mountain lions selecting for more elk we see in, in more uh, socially stable mountain lion populations, higher elk predation. Uh, we saw a very high coyote predation in, in that country. So the intricacies there are, are even more outlined where you have one predator killing a neonate predator. They are also preying on elk, which are a competitor. There's just a lot of different subtle nuances that we're learning more about as we, as we do more work. Boy, the delay is killing me. Okay, um, you heard Justin Binfett talk about this yesterday. Uh, we're, I'm very excited, we're very excited about this work we're doing in, in the Bates Hole area and in the Casper region, where we're actually trying to assess the role of predation in relation to CWD. It's a very difficult question to answer, but we're very proud to be designing a study to do it versus a modeling study or something like that. Um, uh, we're, we'll be finishing up the mountain lion component next year. We can again look at kill rates and diet composition where we're seeing about half of the predation is on mule deer, but we also have a, a high component of, of elk predation, pronghorn predation. And again, this is a great a collaboration with the University of Wyoming and our research partners. And again, all these things inform our management better. Uh, we're trying to understand these predator prey relationships as we move forward with changes in mule deer management and setting seasons for mountain lions. And I, I, we're very excited to see the, the final results of some of this work that we're doing. So wolf monitoring, it, it's hard to believe that we can stand up, that I can stand up here and say we've somewhat normalized the notions of wolf monitoring and management. Uh, there's still a lot of polarity, obviously, uh, but the fact that we're in two decades consecutively of meeting 
recovery that we're managing wolves on the landscape through targeted conflict management and through harvest management uh, is just a testament to the, the work done through time. Uh, we are actually at the end of our five-year post delisting period this year. And we, again, will be meeting with you in July to, to, do, to bring forth proposed regulations. One thing with wolves that's unique is that we can maintain, we use radio collars. We try to keep at least, at least a collar and a pack in, in order to basically, in essence, we're doing a census, census of wolves in the trophy game management area of Northwest Wyoming. It also allows us to, to uh, more accurately deal with conflict scenarios. And you learn a lot of information from any time you have an animal on hand, as you know. And that's just, this is last year's uh, packs you can see throughout Northwest Wyoming. Those packs are dynamic, they move through time. Uh, but what we see here is, is we're pretty saturated in the Northwest part of the state where we manage four wolves. Uh, 46 wolves collared in that trophy game area in 2021. And so we have a good distribution throughout Northwest Wyoming of these wolves. Again, I'll click through these so they come across. We're, we're meeting our minimum requirements and our objective. You know, we're well above our minimum requirements. We get, we get accused of managing down to the bare minimum. That's not the truth. We manage to a level that we can ensure that we're going to maintain a recovered population. And there's also another 100 wolves in Yellowstone National Park and wolves on the reservation that, that don't go into these numbers. Huh. And what I like to point out to is we, we've gotten away from these spikes and depredation and things like that. Um, when you have wolves and livestock on the landscape, there's going to be conflict. But I think through targeted removal and a lot of the work that we've done with wildlife services, with producers, to try to, to, try to bring that to a manageable level. And Brian will be talking more about that. But I, I, we want to get away from this notion of this yo-yo back and forth of listing, delisting, yo-yos of wolves back and forth. And again, we have national, international scrutiny on this. Uh, we're, we're currently, there, there's lawsuits in a, a Fish and Wildlife Service review in place status assessment on wolves in the Northern Rocky Mountains. Um, again, this, this fine scale movement really allows us, and you'll see Ken Mills present this uh, upcoming. You know, the, the numbers are pretty hard to refute, which is nice. Uh, you, you heard Joe Condilis from Western Bear Foundation talk about a lot of the work that that Game and Fish is doing along with the university. We're, just, we're seeing an increasing interest in, in black bear harvest in the state. <laughs> I got a time like my switching of slides 10 seconds before I'm gonna say it. Um, I think you've, you've, we've already went through this, but we really appreciate having this systematic approach to how we can, we can evaluate black bear density. Uh, that was one thing that was questioned. You heard questions about our harvest surveys yesterday. We've been questioned about black bears and mountain lions because we don't have actual numbers. The fact that we can have a systematic approach to black bears has really helped for ourselves and our managers to talk with the public about what's going on. Um, this was in the Bighorns last summer. We'll continue work this summer as well. And again, we will be setting black bear seasons next winter. So we'll be meeting and meeting with you in January, meeting with the regions in December, November and December. We'll hope to have results from this last few years work in order to corroborate our population demographics, potentially looking at some changes in hunt areas, boundaries and things like that. Grizzly bear monitoring, again, uh, despite the uh, federal oversight, we're doing the majority of work when it comes to grizzly bears. We have the most bears in Wyoming. We have the, the infrastructure to do so as well. Um, and we continue to lead that monitoring effort. You'll remember Dan Bjornley's talk about the aerial captures this last summer, which is something pretty exciting. You know, our goal is to maintain a representative sample of grizzly bears in the northwest part of the state in order to assess survival, fecundity, mortality, things like that. And again, I think the, you know, adding tools, it would be easy to, to just kind of go status quo and do what we've always done. We're always trying to find new ways and 
including another tool such as the aerial captures helps us to assess areas that are very difficult to attain a representative sample of. Um, you know, the efficiency and safety for our people is, is very important. And the notion of having complete selectivity in a capture is something even new to us. And I think you saw, you know, this is that wilderness area in the back country. This was an area that was void, and this is just the, the locations we obtained last summer to completely fill that, that data gap. And one more thing, we were talking about uh, numbers. Uh, so the, the current methodology, before it was updated, had a conservative bias to it. And it's based on this notion, the Chow 2 estimate. So what we're seeing, so the real number would be going on this scale. What we see with the population size as it increases in density is the number becomes lower and lower through time, which is frustrating, beyond frustrating. And so if you can see, this is based on unique observations of females with cubs. So I'm gonna walk you through this. The different colors are each a female with cubs of the years, cubs of the year. So the truth is there's 11 females with cubs of the year on the map there. What we do in this, this model based on previous data was you would basically put, it might be hard to see, you put this, concentric circle around these locations. And if they overlap, you can't say that they're different. So you're underestimating. The number that you get from real is 11, but you put seven into the model because of the way that conservative bias was built in decades ago. Well, we used empirical data through time in this long-term data set to revise that. Instead of a 30 kilometer circle, 16 kilometers. You can see how much that differentiates so there's still one of those you can't differentiate, but you're getting close to what we feel is real on the ground. And instead of talking about 700 bears in the population, you can see the population estimate goes up by as much as 34 to 40%. It's just representing what's real. The other thing that you'll see is that the trend has not flattened as much as we had been postulated in the past. And again, this is using long-term data sets to, to show that. And so when we're talking, we kind of bottom or topped out at around 750 bears. Now we're talking, and this is within that DMA, but the numbers there that are on there are highlighted are the numbers of the population with the current updated methodology in 2007 and 2017 when they were relisted, delisted, sorry. In 2007, we were talking about 570 bears at the time they were delisted then, but it was more likely eight to 900. And now I'd like to turn it over to Brian DeBolt. I'll be back up for the end. President Roberts and members of the commission, Director Nesvik, I appreciate the opportunity to yeah, give you another, I guess, summary of <clears throat> our large carnivore conflicts for the year 2021. And there will be an emphasis on grizzly bears, of course. Um, and of course, everybody asks, well, what do you consider a conflict? <clears throat> and it is, I'm oh, sorry, one, one too many. Um, it's definitely, a, it's a bona fide conflict where property is damaged, livestock's killed, um, a human is injured or, you know, let's say a, a trophy game animal is killed as a direct result of, of human activity, a vehicle strike or something like that. So <clears throat> it's not just a bear, you know, sighting or, you know, benign encounter. It, it's an actual conflict. So we're obviously seeing an increase in conflict numbers. And we like to say why, you know, we, what is the natural occurrence that's that's happening that that's resulting in increase in in conflicts of course the abundance and availability of natural foods obviously you know we've been in a kind of a drought cycle and that definitely has an impact on on the foods that are available on the landscape for these critters to find and if they can't they're going to search areas in and around humans where they can find food and, and come into conflict with people 
Um, but the number of conflicts is also really highly correlated with the social tolerance in an area. Or a great example is, you know, in Jackson Hole. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the tolerance of grizzly bears is extremely high. And even though bears are mm, maybe in situations where they could create a lot of conflict, again, the tolerance is so high that uh, that's accepted on a much greater level than, you know, maybe any other bear or lion across the West that's causing some sort of conflict. So it definitely has to do with numbers. So even though we're talking numbers today, uh, I want to try to talk about the big picture, not just, yeah, I mean, how many, how many cattle got killed by bears this year, but the big picture of the whole thing. Um, and what is actually happening, you know, it's, and again, I'm focusing more on bears, but this um, is equivocal with all of our species. We have more large carnivores and more people, period. So wherever they coexist, you're gonna have a lot of conflicts, okay? Um, but realistically, and again, focusing on grizzly bears, you know, what's the most logical reason? So this is a graph. The point of this is to show, you know, the red line shows uh, the percent of occupied habitat of grizzly bears outside that demographic monitoring area is as big as the state of New Jersey, okay? That's a lot area, put that into perspective. That's not only outside of Yellowstone National Park, outside of the wilderness areas, but outside of the DMA. So a significant amount of that area in um, Wyoming, Montana and Yellowstone um, is outside suitable habitat, okay? And what happens in those areas? Why is it considered um, outside of suitable habitat? Because it's most of it's private land and it's dominated by human use activities, you know, livestock grazing, oil and gas production, subdivisions, you know, towns. Uh, so we see the, the use of private lands by grizzly bears significantly increasing over time. So, um, and again, um, how much, how much, to put that into perspective, how much area is that? Well, you know, over 12,000 square kilometers, which is bigger than Yellowstone, Grand Teton, and JDR combined, okay? So that's the amount of just private land um, outside the DMA that grizzly bears are using. <laughs> Very significant, okay? And they're still producing, you know, grizzly bears over the long term. So um, again, that increased conflict potential, what does that mean? It means we're dealing with new stuff, you know? Bears tearing up oat bales, bears in cornfields, um, just diff different types of conflicts that, that maybe we're not used to handling. I know Montana's seen a lot of that too, as bears expand eastward into Montana. You know, there's not a tree for 20 miles and these bears are causing significant damage. So um, here's the numbers, again, of conflicts that, that our personnel dealt with. And again, this includes not only the large carnivore folks, but the game wardens and biologists around the state for sure. Uh, it's definitely a group effort. It takes a village. And so I'll kind of go through some of these species by species for you. Mountain lion conflicts. Again, most of those are just uh, mountain lions killing sheep. That's what they do. Domestic sheep, for sure. Um, we did have one kind of aggressive encounter where a, a mountain lion continued to follow a hunter back to his truck, you know, repeatedly coming close. And um, they both got out unscathed, but that's what that one was. Um, as a result, we removed four mountain lions from the population. We didn't relocate any last year. Wolf conflicts, again, most wolves just kill cattle. That's what happens. And uh, as a result of that, within the trophy game management area, that doesn't include the predator zone, um, us and wildlife services removed 15 wolves as a result of those conflicts. And as Dan talked about, it still keeps us well within sustainable limits for, you know, a, a, again, a sustainable population of wolves long term. Black bear conflicts, what we see is like we talked about where, you know, not only grizzly bears, but black bears are occupying these private lands in, in areas that's not suitable for black bear occupancy either. And they're getting into garbage in and around people's homes and ranch buildings and whatnot, campgrounds. Um, so as a result of that, you know, we, you know, between the bears that we catch, 
Um, we relocate about half the black bears and remove about half of them. And we're on, we were on par for that last year. So um, grizzly bear conflicts again, um, grizzly bears killing a lot of cattle. Um, it's, uh, it's tough as we talked about a lot today, how to mitigate grizzly bears killing cattle in an open range situation. It's just very difficult. Um, you can't put up fences. Um, and yeah, you can trap and remove bears and it definitely, if you can identify chronic killers, it helps significantly. And there's a lot of data to support that, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a tough situation to manage. We do have bears getting into garbage, killing sheep, beehives, um, lots of different things going on. We had a couple, luckily minor human injuries this year, um, from folks bumping into bears. Um, but again, luckily we had no fatalities. As a result of our management actions, um, we did lethally remove 30 grizzly bears in the state of Wyoming. Most of those of which were again, outside of that suitable habitat area. Um, it just doesn't make good management sense that we um, catch a bear, a grizzly bear in this case, outside of the demographic monitoring area that's um, causing conflict with people, uh, potential threat to human safety, take that bear, turn around and dump him back into the monitoring area, okay? Um, they don't count towards the population. Those bears aren't counted outside and then turn around and dump it inside the population where, again, it's not counted towards the population, but we've added an extra bear to it and an extra conflict bear. So we do remove most of those bears that we, we catch outside of suitable habitat. We did relocate uh, 19 bears again as a result. So again, this um, hands-on management, relocating and removal of grizzly bears, it does fluctuate based on, again, yeah, all these factors, social tolerance, the number of bears in a given area, um, and, uh, uh, availability of natural food resources, you know, um, from year to year, but, you know, we're on kind of a steady, just a slight steady increase in, in our management actions over time. So, you know, we don't just catch bears and, and either kill them or relocate them and that's it. This is all part of the research uh, that goes into, you know, the ongoing uh, monitoring of the population in general. So again, you know, as of in 2020, you know, we surpassed since all oh, the mid 70s, 75 or so when the Craigheads caught bear number one, uh, they're numbered chronologically. Um, most of you are probably aware of that, but um, maybe not. So bears are numbered chronologically. Of course, bear number one that was caught by the Craigheads um, was number one. And we're up to, what are we up to now, Dan? Like 1080? Anyway. Anyway, over a thousand bears now that we've caught that actually wearing a radio collar. That doesn't include young bears that we've captured that we didn't put a radio collar on. They're just too young, so we ear tagged them. You know, there's another four or five hundred of those. But um, anyway, pretty substantial amount of information that we've gathered um, through our monitoring of this grizzly bear population over time. And again, this just basically says um, where most of our conflicts occur in, on private land, okay? It's not like we're out in the woods, you know, um, you know, bear that just happens to, to kill a sheep or wander through a campground or, you know, a mountain lion, uh, maybe doing the same thing. It's just automatically removed. No, most of these conflicts that we're dealing with, again, are on private lands, so. I, uh, so what do we do? Again, as a response to that, we, we relocate bears, we, we you know, um, definitely remove some bears, but before we make any decision on a capture, uh, we try to do some mitigation. Electric fences we use uh, constantly. And I will throw a little pitch in here um, because it's been so good for us lately. We've got some uh, what's called non-lethal money from, um, uh, it was actually a congressional appropriation of wildlife services. Uh, to throw some money at some non-lethal work. And we've put up electric fences around, you know, pig pens and chicken coops and bee yards and <clears throat> just a, a number of things with that money that, that we don't have. And uh, it's done a lot to help 
uh, reduce the number of conflicts. And uh, so I got to throw in a pitch for that. It's just one of the great things that that's done. So um, yeah, we try to try to prevent the conflicts from happening or deter um, the conflict from occurring, you know, educating folks on how to live with bears and lions, um, you know, our annual workshops that we do is, uh, is goes a long ways. We have a lot of information, of course, on our website now. And uh, I mean, door to door, Dan's going to talk a whole lot about this, but education, just teaching folks what the resources are out there um, is, is tremendous. It goes a long ways to prevent conflicts. So securing garbage, huge. Again, I won't belabor that. It's pretty simple. You do your best to secure your garbage um, away from mostly bears. And uh, that goes a long way from preventing long-term conflicts and, and keeping humans safe, frankly. So um, again, disruptive stimuli of some sort. You know, if we can haze a bear that's just in a place where it shouldn't be, for example, um, works real good. Maybe sometimes a bear gets into somebody's apple tree you know, in a, um, you know, a, a rural setting. Um, they're just kind of in the wrong place at the wrong time, but they're not really causing a big conflict. They're causing some big damage to the apple tree, but if we can haze them out of there, um, that's a good way to handle a conflict like that. So um, lots of tools in the toolbox that way. Um, anything that we can do is good. Uh, we're working endlessly and tirelessly and i know dan will probably talk a little bit about some of this but um you know land development restrictions with the counties um any sort of development that's being planned if we can get an opportunity to comment you know in the cody area for example we comment on new developments and whatnot and the potential impacts um, with grizzly bears that may occur there and, and how to how to prevent those or, or mitigate those if they do occur so um all this is done um Again, more is preventative efforts, um, so we don't have to actually handle a bear. Um, our damage compensation program, which you're all extremely familiar with, um, is one way to just help landowners who are experiencing some damage. Um, but when all of these tools that we use, um, and again, here's how much we do pay, or at least in fiscal year 20, I know it's a year behind, but again, because actually some of what we talked about this morning, um, we don't have final numbers for fiscal year 21, but you can just see that we spend a significant amount of money on uh, trophy game damage throughout the state of Wyoming, for sure. So when, when we employ all of these methods and uh, tools that we have to try to prevent damage or alleviate damage or you know, just make it a little you know, less sting for folks, um, when all those options are exhausted, uh, we do attempt some sort of capture, okay? Um, and if human safety is, is an issue, of course, we do that right away. Um, and again, then the disposition of that animal is, uh, we will sure make a recommendation, but that's all determined by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, whether it's, again, a relocation or if, if it's a lethal removal or some sort of live removal to a zoo or, or some other facility. Um, and lastly, you know, part of our conflict program, unfortunately, unfortunately, is a team that we have in place. It's called our predator attack team. Um, that if, if somebody is, you know, injured or killed by an animal, you know, it's our responsibility to go in there. But he asked why, what happened? Um, and we need to determine, I mean, sometimes, you know, um, darn sure people contribute maybe to their own demise in certain circumstances. And um, other cases, you know, maybe we just have a critter out on, there on the landscape that's overly aggressive or something. And it's our job to determine why, what happened? What was, what was the cause of that encounter? There's usually no witnesses. You can't talk to folks about those things. And so we need a good professional response to determine what happened. Therefore, we can make a good appropriate decision on what management action to take. But again, that is just a part of our conflict program that I wanted to touch on. And uh, I think Dan is going to finish up here on some bear wife stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. So yeah, I'll just kind of finish up with our, our Bear Wise Wyoming program. Uh, it's kind of started out as a community program. 
And because of the, the larger global outreach, we went to a Bearwise, Wyoming. And it also, it, it's not just about bear safety, it's large carnivore safety, uh, but most of our educational component is, is dealing with bears. And, um, you know, there's a great, we're, we're updating our website information now, but I still think one of the top views, not the top, obviously, but what people really go and look at our Bearwise page. It's very interactive. It provides a great deal of information for people to reduce their conflict potential. And that's what it's really about. Our job is, try, is to try to reduce conflict potential. And um, there's been a lot of interest in bear smart and bear wise communities that kind of confuse the public. And it's just a good reminder that we've had this bear wise contingent in place since 2005. And it's something that we've built uh, across multiple communities, uh, Wapiti, the Absorca Front, Dubois, and Jackson. And uh, it's something that that really helps bring that public ownership to these scenarios as well. And just an example, uh, Brian touched on this a little bit, but this, we've really gotten good at electric fencing, our own people and working with wildlife services. Uh, we learned the hard way to, to learn when to fence bee apiaries, and it's even best to do it before the bees are there. But sometimes you don't, you're not afforded that opportunity. So um, we do a lot of electric fencing, though. A lot of door-to-door -door magnets. It's beneficial. You know, every every situation is unique. Um, you know, we have scenarios where people are, if we do a community-wide, there's a bear in your area, be careful. Then 50 people show up with cameras to try to do that. So you got to target how the best way is to, to make sure we're doing what's right for people to make them safe. Um, you know, we've done several bear spray giveaways. Those are, those are very, very uh, well taken by the public. And, um, you know, we're looking at creativity. There's a, a program in Jackson that we worked with a local cannery to actually collect the apples to make cider so they're not on the ground for bears to eat. Uh, just some examples. You've seen some of these. Again, it, it's a multi-pronged approach, but uh, this is on one of our uh, over in Whiskey, one of our habitat management areas. This is backcountry in the Bear Tooths. Again, with, with sportsmen donations from bow hunters of Wyoming, Wyoming Outdoorsmen, Game and Fish, uh, Western Bear Foundation. You know, we can we can provide bear spray to licensed hunters, hunters or men and women that fish. And for example, this last year in Lander was the first time we've done that. That's here and. It was kind of on the tail of COVID, so we did it on the outside, so everybody was safe. But um, we didn't know we didn't we didn't know if everybody knew about it. But we got rid of about 120 can, 120 cans of bear spray in about four minutes and 45 seconds, I think. So uh, it went pretty well. And again, this is just some examples of some of that fencing we've done, and with wildlife services. You know, everybody, myself included, everybody's a chicken farmer now, and as more chickens are out there too. Uh, that, that adds another element. And so, you know, we're trying to be proactive with that kind of work that, that is done. Uh, thinking to the future, we're trying to increase the interactive nature of how we, how do we resonate our information with the public? Everybody um, wants their information differently. We're working a lot with statewide comms, and statewide communication section, and our website development to have multiple methods to reach the public and, and to, to reduce that conflict potential. And again, uh, you've heard me say these things before, but uh, we're committed to to working for the people of Wyoming and to maintain these these animals on the landscape. Uh, we have an intact large carnivore guild, and that's something that few people can say. So the same animals that were here a thousand years ago are here now. Uh, that's a testament to the wild lands that we have in Wyoming and the cooperation and support we have from the public. <clears throat> Uh, we will always maintain a very vigilant conflict resolution program bolstered by our public education and awareness. And, you know, it's an exciting time. There's a lot of questions being asked. And so we've got personnel within our section in the department that can answer these questions to provide those, those questions that, that our director is asking, that the public is asking. And one more thing. Um, unfortunately, Dan couldn't be here. He's at a funeral, but... Uh, Dan Bjornley is going to be moving on to uh, 
different fields in Alaska. Uh, but Dan's been the face of grizzly bear, uh, grizzly bear monitoring research and conservation for a couple decades now. And I just wanted to take a chance to thank Dan. You can't see him. This is in a black bear den, but he's back behind this black bear last year, last winter in the Laramie Range home. So just wanted to give a chance to thank Dan. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions should you have any. I got a couple questions real quick. Sure. So I just the gentleman yesterday alluded to a mountain lion and how much mule deer they consume. What's our department? So, uh, President Roberts, members of the commission, Director Neswick. Yeah, yeah, that, that was interesting. Um, it depends on where you look. Uh, we're seeing 30 to 30 to 30 to 40 adult sized mule deer, depending on where you're at annually, taken by. A mountain lion. It's different between males and females. Females generally take more deer uh, than males. Males generally take more elk. Um, but that the metric, the industry standard, I guess I would say, was one ungulate size kill a week. That could be three coyotes. That could be one pronghorn. That could be an elk calf. Uh, but the the number that I heard yesterday of 152 deer annually by one lion is. I, I guess I've never seen that or heard of that in the literature. Yeah. We see in that 30 to 40 range and some, and some neonates as well. And one other question, what was the number of the bear, the old bear that you showed the picture of the first in his job? Uh, one. And when you think of it, just let me know. That's yeah, quite yeah. a fast. He was 34 day. years old. Yeah. 34 years old and yep. you lost him and then he came back. And yeah, he, he was actually, he was captured in the eighties as part of, uh, the initial look at um, at depredation. So part of it was called the Black Rock study. And um, it was caught as part of that study, it was caught once more and then disappeared for two decades and then was recaptured. Still managed with those teeth to kill a calf, um, to gum it to death basically. But uh, it was a very emaciated bear and it was put down, that was two summers ago. 34 years 34 old. 34 years old, yep. Mr. President. You had 608,000 last year in damage claims. You have a, you ought to have a pretty good guess for, or for two years ago, you ought to have a pretty good guess for last year. It's got to be a lot worse. Well, I mean, we averaged three to 500,000 uh, for, for trophy game damage. In some years, we, we've, we've kind of seen the wolf go down a little bit. Uh, grizzly bears, um, it, it, it does depend. It is, it does depend on the year. It does depend on management actions, but we, Still consider three to five hundred thousand annually is what we're going to see. Any likes? Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate it. Oh, okay. We'll move on to number fifteen, Nish. President Roberts, commissioners, and Director Nesbitt, thank you for having me today. I would like to present today on some updates of a snapshot of where we're at with education and outreach. Thank you. So here's kind of a look at our current education efforts. And so mainly we focus on hunter education camps being an outdoors woman, and of course, Expo. So currently we have 3,420 total hunter education graduates last year. This number is a little low for the demand we're seeing. We estimate that we probably need to be targeting around 5,000 graduates a year but we also have kind of a lag because of COVID the last couple of years with shutdowns. And so we do have a great demand for hunter education and that's gonna be a significant focus for our team going forward. Currently that last year, we had 162 volunteers who taught hunter education. That number also includes some of our staff. We know that we need more volunteer efforts in this area in order to sustain that 5,000 number a year we would likely need 300 hunter education instructors. 
So going forward on this topic, we'll be looking at how we can integrate Hunter education into more schools. We do have some schools, 17, that are offering Hunter education, but that number isn't significant enough to really have a huge impact. And again, we had 204 Hunter education courses offered last year. We've been trying to collect data on how many um, participants we reach through our outreach, um, education, and other programs. And roughly right now, it looks like 6,847. And this has all been collected through employees that have been working on education and outreach programs, primarily um, our team at headquarters, and then our information and education specialists that are spread out through the regions. We think we can definitely build on this number going forward. And so I want to show you this this year so that when I come back next year, we have a different kind of number. In terms of camps, this year we have eight total camps, five four-day family camps. And I believe three of those are full already and we have two that still have openings. We have um, two camps for one for boys and one for girls ages 14 to 16 year olds. Those are both full as well. And then we have one four day educator camp that also counts to towards their uh, recertification and professional development. And then, yeah, all together 88. That number's gone up a little bit, but I couldn't get the exact number this morning. So um, I've been asking a lot of questions in terms of our camps and where do we, what do we do with these kids or these participants afterwards? And so that's gonna be a goal going forward to see how we can engage them down the road as volunteers, as interns, as leading into our fellowship program or becoming hunter education instructors and those kinds of things. We think there's a lot of other opportunities that we can track some of these, um, all of these participants, hopefully, but at least a lot of them to be game and fish ambassadors for the department and for our state going forward. Becoming an Outdoors Woman is a very popular program. Right now we have 82 applicants just for this year. Um, since 2018, we've had 179 women go through this program. And we have two programs. We have Being an Outdoorsman and Outdoors Woman, excuse me, and then Beyond Bow. Um, we are contemplating having two bow uh, camps next year, just because of the demand right now. So that will definitely um, be reviewed after this year. Currently in Expo, so the number there is 2,400 students. As of this morning, we have 2,700 students that have signed up for Expo, um, 72 booths. Normally we see around 6,000 participants and we have 160 department employees that are helping with Expo this year, um, which will be held again, May 5th to the 7th in Casper, Wyoming. These numbers are, they sound really nice until you look at the whole picture in Wyoming of how many kids are in Wyoming. So when I came on board with the department, that was the first question I had. And it, School-aged kids in Wyoming, we have roughly 93,000. If you were to include early childhood education and higher education, that number would go up significantly. So if you roughly figure there's 100,000 kids in Wyoming, 2,700 is 2.7%. I think we can do a better job. And I think we can spread this out across the state and work to be in more communities and work with the regions to have different impacts without a huge workload on our staff. And that's kind of the overview for right now. So I just want to tell you where we're at right now and kind of where we want to start targeting a greater effort going forward. I definitely feel like we have a lot of opportunity to scale up in this area and especially under the Inspire a Kid program, we can do more. Any questions? <clears throat> Mr. For most President? of these camps is Whiskey oh. Mountain. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mr. President, on Whiskey Mountain, where are we at as far as capacity and the use of that facility? 
You know, we run that pretty much, it is pretty much at full capacity through the entire summer. So we could maybe, we were looking at it this year, maybe squeeze in one more camp in there or two at the most, which if we were to do that, that would likely be um, another boys camp or another girls camp or maybe another bow camp. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks, this will be item number 16. Uh, good afternoon, uh, President Roberts, Director Nesvik, members of the commission. For the last item today, we've asked Kyle Bernice to join us and give an update on the Via Ferrata. Uh, Kyle is a uh, district manager with Wyoming State Parks, and he'll give us an update on where they're at with uh, Via Ferrata planning. Uh, he'll be joining us via Zoom. He's actually working in Cheyenne this week, so appreciate Kyle's willingness to come and visit, and we'll, looks like he's ready to go. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, again, my name is Kyle Bernice. I'm a district manager with Wyoming State Parks. Um, I'm over the southwest part of the state, which includes Sinks Canyon, Bear River, Fort Bridger, Seminole State Park, and South Pass City. Uh, so just to give you a quick update, um, since we last met, I believe we've had continued to have some uh, stakeholder meetings that were in progress at that time. Um, and what came out of that was that we came to consensus on an alternative route for the Via Ferrata project at Sings Canyon. <clears throat> so if you recall, the original route was ha had some concerns uh, regarding conflict with or potential conflict with, with nesting raptors, uh, specifically peregrine falcons that had come up. Um, and so working with some of the stakeholders, we landed on an alternative route, which is at the sandstone buttress. Uh, that's the new proposed route. And that is across the street from the sawmill campground for anybody who's familiar with, uh, with that site. Uh, so <clears throat> we're continuing to work through that. We've still got a list of things that need to happen before any type of development or construction can happen there. And what we're landing on right now or working through is, is uh, setting up dates for, uh, for cultural surveys. So right now I'm working with SHPO office um, and with the TIPO offices for uh, Eastern Shoshone and, and the Northern Arapaho tribes to, to try and come together and, and get some dates for cultural surveys uh, and, and coordinating all of that. Um, and, and until that happens, there, there's nothing, we, we can't move forward until those are cleared. Uh, so um, we're looking at potentially, we don't have any dates set right now, but it would have to be after the winter's gone and, and there's no snow anywhere in that area. So we're looking at potentially late spring, early summer tentatively for that. Uh, so if, if you have any questions about any of that or, or, or comments, I'm happy to help answer those. Any commissioners have any questions? Uh, but we don't have any, thank you for the update. We don't have any questions, Kyle. Uh, I've got a few blue sheets. Uh, if, is there, if you could stay on the line with this, uh, a few people would like to address the commission, if that'd be okay? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, the first one I have is Barbara Oakleaf. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? This yeah, sure. am I coming through? Um, thank you for having us here or having me here. Thank you for uh, listening to um, things concerning uh, Sinks Canyon State Park. I'm Barbara Oakleaf. I've been a Lander resident for 40 plus years. I come from a Wyoming game and fish family, exactly three generations worth. Um, I grew from my childhood to my current age, <clears throat> which will remain unmentioned. Um, 
with great respect for the department. Um, employees and their families make large sacrifices that require a belief in the worth of wildlife within Wyoming. Summers, I'm, uh, on a personal note, summers disappear quickly when raptor surveys, peregrine reintroductions, butts right up against black-footed ferret surveys, black-footed ferret reintroductions. So I guess I'm coming to you saying I am well vested in the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. <clears throat> now I come before you go as a member of Sinks Canyon Wild. This organization started because our local game and fish did not enter into the Sinks Canyon State Park Master Plan in a meaningful or credible way. They did not assist the park or even the original Via Ferrata planners in ways that would keep Sinks Canyon wild, which was the number one issue stated in the master plan. As with many Lander residents, I am severely disillusioned to hear from some in the game and fish that Sinks Canyon wildlife habitat management area is seen as a sacrifice zone already too far gone to worry about. That attitude does not address the need to keep the canyon wild. Research is showing, to no one's surprise, that it is far easier to maintain wildlife areas than to restore places that have been lost to commercial development and intense recreational activities. If the department doesn't work actively with state parks to set boundaries within their mandate for wildlife within the park, our community will lose our best asset. We need those areas within the park that are not already developed to have protection for improvement for wildlife, not to experience continued degra degradation. <clears throat> we need our local game and fish leaders to believe in their mission again. I think I believe that the commission, as a public voice within the department structure, have a role to play in that mission. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Ron Smith. Mr. President, Commission, thank you for uh, this opportunity to speak to you folks. Uh, before I get started, I want to thank you folks. You have such a diverse and important uh, <clears throat> function in Wyoming for Wyoming citizens and Wyoming's wildlife. And like my friend Barbara Oakleaf, uh, I too have great respect for the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. I'm a former employee, so always have a special place in my heart for you folks. Um, my name is Ron Smith. As I mentioned, I am an officer of Sinks Canyon Wild today. Uh, and I just wanna let you know, and I'm sure you know this, is that Sinks Canyon is really important to the citizens of Lander. And you also, I'm sure know that uh, about 70% of Sinks Canyon State Park is owned by the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and it's a designated wildlife management habitat unit. It was purchased with federal dollars and it was purchased with uh, sportsman's dollars. So I'm really happy to see that you folks are taking a vested interest in Sinks Canyon. As my friend Barbara mentioned, uh, we don't believe that the Wyoming Game and Fish Department had a very meaningful input into the state park master plan. And it's unfortunate because I think a lot of the issues that you folks are involved with and we're talking about right now could have been avoided if uh, the department had had a much more uh, vigorous input into the, into the master plan. <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, we recently received uh, uh, some messages from department personnel that they, are, they will just simply defer to uh, state park decisions regarding uh, the, the state park. And uh, I just want to point out that obviously state parks in the game and fish department have 
totally entirely different missions. And we think that wildlife is an important part of the mission that should be associated with Sinks Canyon State Parks. And so that's, that's basically all I wanted to say. I'm really glad and happy that you folks are taking vested interest in Sinks Canyon. Thank you. Thank you. Pointress. Hello. Hi. Hi. That's, can you hear me? <laughs> I'm Lenny Poitras. I am an officer for the Red Desert Audubon Society. And thank you for letting us speak. Um, this has been a very hot button issue for our little community. Um, and I want to thank Kyle for um, working with us. I recently met with him. And we are working on trying to get a wildlife through or worth of watching um, area where we will put in uh, um, some optics so that we can look at the wildlife and, and have some um, materials to educate the public about that. So thank you, Kyle. That's been very, very helpful. And we appreciate that. Um, one thing that we would like to request is looked into more is there's a, a bit of a conundrum in um, state parks and game and fish as far as the um, exclusions to the nesting areas. And we would request that, that they work together closely so that we can get some um, closures to those areas during the nesting season. Um, seasonal closures. And so that's our primary interest in that for the um, Red Desert Audubon Society. So thank you very much. And uh, we appreciate your, your listening. Thank you. Um, Crane, Eva. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, you'll have to help me with the last one. Um, trope, I'm trope. Tom Trope, is that it? Troop. <laughs> uh, Mr. Uh, President and members of the commission, I am Tom Troop, a resident of Lander, and I also uh, participate on the board of Sinks Canyon Wild. And I'd like to follow up with a comment that uh, Kyle made a moment ago. And I'm not sure I heard him correctly, but I just want to, uh, to make certain that the uh, point is clear for the commission. I thought I heard Kyle say that there had been some kind of consensus or agreement among the parties for an alternate site for the Via Ferrata in Sinks Canyon. Uh, that is not true. Um, at the third negotiating meeting, the site on the Paragon Cliff was withdrawn. There was a proposal by the private proponents for a new site on uh, the sandstone buttress, also known as the Gunky uh, Cliff. But we need to be very clear that there was no consensus. There was no coming together of the groups on that new site. That new site is nothing more than a new location that has its own set of problems that need to be thoroughly analyzed. And then once there is a specific proposal, that proposal needs to go back to the agencies and to the public for review before there's any movement forward on it. So I simply wanted to make that clear. I'm not sure I understood Kyle uh, clearly, but I wanted to make sure that there is no consensus around the new site, that it will require a lot of review. There are a number of problems and I uh, wanted the commission to, uh, to know that. And thank you for your time today. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, any commissioners have any questions or anything that's the last? Um... Okay, thanks everybody for, uh, thanks for that last presentation. Thank you everybody for your comments. I appreciate it. And uh, that will be, as far as I see on the agenda, besides call to the public, 
Uh, so I'll officially open the call to the public now in case anybody has any comments, concerns, or anything that they would like for the commission to know that has not been addressed today. Um, is there anything on the internet we should look for or Okay, so at, uh, I'd like to thank everybody, as always, a fabulous job by the department, a fabulous job by the people who showed up and gave their input, and it was, it was a long, grueling couple of days to begin with, but uh, got through it, and uh, I'm very pleased with how we did it. Uh, so with that, uh, I would entertain a motion that uh, we would adjourn. We'll hear mo on. Mr. Jolovich will make, make a motion, and... Uh, Commissioner Byrd has seconded it. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Hearing none, the, the commission meeting will be adjourned. Thank you, everybody, and everybody drive safe and have a nice day.